Long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. I am your host, constant reader Scott Daly, and I'm joined, as always, by the boogeyman, daylighting as a therapist. It's Matt Freeman. How's it going today, Dr. Matt? It's going fantastic. I can't wait to hear about all of your fears um, in this podcast, which is exactly what we're going to be talking about. I mean, you know, you joke, but yeah, kind kind (laughs) of. It's kind of the idea of a horror short story collection. I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. And that is because this week on the show, we move on to our second book of season three. This is our season covering all of Stephen King's greatest hits, a.k.a. one book from each decade. But we also wanted to cover some different stuff, and that's why this series is going to be a little bit different. We are taking a look at King's 1978 short story collection titled Night Shift. This week on the show, we are going to be reading and discussing five stories out of this collection. We'll be talking about Graveyard Shift, Night Surf, I Am the Doorway, The Mangler, and we'll finish everything up with The Boogeyman. And some of you, our our eagle-eared listeners out there, might have noticed that I haven't mentioned the first book in the collection, the one that the collection starts with, Jerusalem's Lot. And that is on purpose and it's because we've previously covered both jerusalem's lot and one for the road uh the quasi sequel to salem's lot on a season two episode after we finished up our coverage of salem's lot so if you would like to listen to us talk about those two stories you can check out episode 2.13 from season two that's the one right after we finished salem's lot and we talked about those for uh, a long time those two stories we talked about Mm -hmm. and they were fun they were they were a lot of fun, but I didn't I didn't think it was worth our time uh, and our listeners time to revisit and and re talk about those stories. So I thought we'd focus on the ones that we hadn't read yet. And that's uh, that's what we're doing today, Matt. Sounds good. I'm excited for this, actually. I was a little worried going into this series, Matt, because you and I have never really talked about short stories in this format before. And I was like, are we going to have anything to say? And it's it's kind of remarkable to me how much I was excited to talk to you about these stories after reading them. I don't think all of them work. I think these are, you know, very early King stories. And so there's there's some moments in them where I'm just like, eh, I don't think that quite worked. But I, I do think they're pretty fascinating uh, just as a, an examination of storytelling. I agree. I mean, I love the medium of short story. I love analyzing short stories in particular because they're so tightly written typically especially the best Mm -hmm. ones yeah um you know we talked a little bit i think it was in the last couple of episodes about the show that i used to do um so-called writers where we we would write a short story every week and we would talk about the short stories and i'm probably going to reference the reason i'm mentioning that now is i'm probably going to reference it a bunch of times as we do this episode (laughs) because some of these stories like just really remind me of so-called writer's stories in the in the specific sense of of being like clearly i i i can feel that king had like a vibe or a mental image or a a very specific inspiration that led to this story and he and he really didn't know how to develop it into like a full-fledged story and mm-hmm. so he said all right i'm just going to try to convey this feeling going to try to nail it to the page and that's that's the thing that's the work um there's a lot of so-called writer stories that end up like that and there's a lot of stories in this collection that end up like that um so i very much kind of relate to um the i the the feeling uh, of some of these stories mm-hmm. and i'm really gonna yeah i, I agree with you I, i'm i was unusually excited to talk about uh this this stuff i, I think i just really like short stories me too. I do too. Um, I'm I'm so I'm so glad to hear that. And th- I mean, before we get into it, I think we should say this is you're reading this book, right? Like, like with your eyes. I even bought a paper copy, so I'm not just Whoa. reading it on my phone or whatever. Whoa! How's that? Yeah. How was that experience for you? It was it was cool, man. I was I I had some travel this weekend, so I was actually reading a paper book on an airplane, which basically made me feel like I was some kind of jet setting 1950s character um i mean who does that right who has you look around an airplane you see kindle kindle ipad kindle kindle i don't know if i saw a single paper book in that airport i'm not gonna i'm I'm like not exaggerating um i I am i am such a like a one of those snobby like (laughs) i like reading physical copy books purist 
but like there came a time, I think it was literally when I took the book it to Hawaii with me. Um, there was a time when I was carting this book around multiple <laughs> airports and the entire several islands of Hawaii where I said, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I'm just bringing a Kindle from now on. And, and uh-huh. that's, that's the truth. When I, when I travel, it's definitely the Kindle. I still love reading physical books, but yeah, when I'm traveling Kindle a hundred percent. It makes sense. I basically just got the paper copy as the novelty, honestly. <laughs> well, I'm, pr- I'm proud of you. I'm proud. Not that, let me, let me let me preface this, not that there's anything wrong with audiobook reading. Obviously, it is still reading. And I think you have proved through the years we've been doing this show that you glean just as much insight uh, via that method as, as anyone does any other way. But uh, it's just cool to see you get to, to read with eyes for the sure. first time. And it's a little bit different, yeah. The eyes, yeah. the eyes on my face, the eyes on my, on my fingers. Oh, that would have been a good joke that I should have made. Thank you. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> you left it right there for me, so you know. <laughs> All right. Um, before we get into night shift proper, though, I did want to have a, a a quick announcement for you folks. This Friday, we are doing our monthly book club. Uh, it's technically March's book club, but we're we're perpetually running a week behind this year due to some illness that that unfortunately hit us a couple months ago. Uh, but we're going to be talking about the book Cloud Cuckoo Land, uh, a book that was chosen by Matt in in our semi-annual We Pick 'em. And uh, I'm just about wrapped up with this book, Matt. And I, I'm really excited to talk to you about it because I, I really enjoyed this book. And uh, and I hope that, that people have read it before. I didn't actually know that this was uh, like a, a book by... It, it's, it's a man named Anthony Doerr uh, who won the Pulitzer for All the Light You Cannot See, which is a book that I felt like everyone was reading a few years ago. And I didn't even know that, that he, that it was the same guy. I didn't know that either. Um, the, the reason I picked the book is it has been recommended to me very hard by some uh, readers who I, whose taste I really trust. And um, I, I uh, basically, yeah, the book is working on me. Uh, uh, and so oh. I'm looking forward to talking about it. Is there like a reason why you can't just say also my mom? <laughs> also, also my mom. I was like, um, is he is he like trying to hide it? <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to hide the fact that that my mom no uh yeah well my my mom is a reader whose taste I really trust yeah um, yeah quite a lot and I mean uh, she's the, the the infuriating thing is she's always recommending me things and I'm always putting them off and then whenever I get around to them I'm like yeah this is like one of the best things ever. Like she recommended Breaking Bad to me for years before I finally got around to Breaking Bad. And I was like, yeah, wow. okay, this is my favorite TV show now, you know. So, um, yes, I, I I trust my mom's taste. And I'm not embarrassed to say it. I mean, you were a little embarrassed, but I forced it out of you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That is Cloud Cuckoo Land. <laughs> it will be on our YouTube page uh, at 9.30 p.m. on Friday uh April 7th? Yes, that is the date it will be. Friday, April 7th at 9.30 Central Time. Uh, we'll be over there talking all about this book. So please join us and hang out for an hour or so and, and chat about this this interesting and wonderful novel. All right, Matt, let's get into it. Let's talk all about Night Shift. Um, and before we get into the stories themselves, I, I think like we kind of always do on first book weeks, uh, I thought we'd spend some time talking about the book as a whole, uh, just some general information. This novel was purchased purchased published in 1978 so that puts us one year after the shining in our chronology uh king has by this time written and published three novels we have carrie salem's lot and the shining there's also a bachman book novel in there called rage but we won't really be talking about that one um the stand by the way comes out later this year uh later in 1978 i think night shift came out first and then the stand came out in the fall um so that that makes 1978 one of many many king twofer years which is there's so many of those which is an insane thing to say matt because it takes so long to make books but king has had so many years in his career that he's released more than one books and this is i think the first one that's good to know okay yeah cool. <laughs> it is also king's first of 11 short story collections he will publish over the course of his career so far um the, the majority of the stories in this collection had been published earlier and elsewhere mostly in magazines uh, many of them are old too. Uh, graveyard shift the first story we're talking about today was originally published in cavalier magazine in 1970 night surf was published in 1969 in uh, king's uh 
college literary journal was the first place that was published. Um, so it's really interesting here, you know, right now we, we have a guy who's written three novels at this point, written and released three novels. Um, they've seen, you know, moderate success with Salem's lot to massive success with both Carrie and the shining. And now he's kind of like, he's made it and he's going like, Hey, I wrote all this stuff years ago and no one really cared anything about it. Do you care now? And the public is like, yes, a hundred percent. I do. Please give me, give me all of this. That's great. I, I would totally do this if I was in his position. I, I'm mm-hmm. sure it's really hard to watch your your first children uh, languish in obscurity when you have the power to finally get them the exposure that you always felt they deserved. Um, sure. Even if maybe you know that they might not be like the best. That's I think okay. that's the interesting thing about this too, because I think, you know, you're, you're always your own worst critic. Right. And I think if you, if you asked him candidly, King would probably say is like, yeah, a lot of the stories in here aren't great. Um, and, and I'm sure he did a little bit of cleanup, um, between, you know, when he wrote them originally in their published form and, and the, this finalized form in this novel, I'm sure he did a little bit of editing cleanup, but not too much. Actually, I think a lot mm-hmm. of these, I think he allows, to 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 remain pretty much pretty much the way they were uh when they were first written which does show you know uh, maybe not like confidence but like i don't know just willingness to be like yeah i was younger uh these aren't as good but i like them and i i think you should read them you know yeah and i can i can kind of hang with that you know like i have some stories that i wrote in kind of a so-called writer's situation like 15 years ago and like, and I actually like them, but it's like, I like them for what they are. Could I, mm-hmm. could I make them better? I could make them better, but making them better would make them very different. And it, and it would probably lose a kind of spark of weirdness that I actually like. And so if I was ever in a position mm-hmm. to publish those really old stories, I'd probably publish them the way they were because like modern Matt would just kind of destroy what was special and and weird about them yeah um so i can understand wanting to just be like this this is what it is you know it it get kind of kind of warts and all like it doesn't really work if you quote unquote fix it it just is this specific thing um i, I get it sure yeah and and you know i wish more creatives were like this honestly like i mean i'm gonna go back to my digging at george lucas well but i wish he would just <laughs> leave those things alone yeah and, and not not need to tinker constantly i think I, I think king has done relatively little tinkering over the course of his career i mean there is you know he did uh re-release a version of the gunslinger after the rest of the dark tower came out that included some pretty major edits to, to just line it up to where that that series eventually ends up going um some people do not like that version. We get we get many comments and emails from people that are like, "Not my version." Nope, not mine. Um, which is which is fine. Um, I just think it's it's interesting that that I think there's relatively little of that in in King's career. Yeah, that is interesting. Cool. All right, Matt. I did hear before we get into the stories. Want to take a quick moment to discuss King's forward because he writes a pretty extensive forward here, and I find it absolutely fascinating. Because in this forward, King is ruminating for you know a dozen pages or so on kind of the nature of horror. He talks about you know why he writes horror, and then he he talks about um, why he thinks people read it. And I think I think I, I like this passage right here a whole lot. It says. In the stories that follow, you will encounter all manner of night creatures, vampires, demon lovers, a thing that lives in the closet, all sorts of other terrors. None of them are real. The thing under my bed waiting to grab my ankle isn't real. I know that. And I also know that if I'm careful to keep my foot under the covers, it will never be able to grab my ankle. I just, I love that take, you know, like this, this thing that like, he, he, I think perfectly sums up the idea of horror is that like, we read these stories because we know they're not real, but also a little part of us thinks maybe they are um, or, or, or will act as if they are anyway. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I agree. I, I think, I, I think I, I just love King's whole kind of philosophical approach to horror mm-hmm. where he is actually using it to push buttons in your mind, to, you know, very thoughtfully and carefully and, and specifically it's, it's not for him. It's not a kind of, of lazy, like, Oh, I'm just gonna follow the genre conventions and do the genre thing. It's it's a it's like a philosophical thing for him. Um, you know, I, I've 
I felt for a long time that it's very conceited of of novelists and writers who pretend that their function is not to be entertainers. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I like about Stephen King is he is successful as an entertainer. He he knows he's an entertainer. He's trying to be the best entertainer that he can be. And he's being thoughtful about it and original and specific in his intentions. Um, And he just, even, you know, much younger King, I, I think that still applies to the way he approaches his stories. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it's really interesting that like, it's not that King in this forward is like, you know, drawing a line and like defending his chosen genre per se against the mm-hmm. unfair critiques of it. But it, it is interesting that we see him this early in his career kind of already bristling at this idea that horror itself is not taken as seriously as like the serious dramas. And one of the things he's doing in this forward is talking about, you know, yeah, all, all all stories kind of talk about the central thing, which is this idea of what we fear. And I think he gets into specifically like the, the thing we all fear is death and all of our, all stories are in some way central around death but you know d- dramas and and literature look at these these fears much less directly and like horror is allowed to just live in it and see the consequences of it and really embrace these ideas in a way that nothing else can and it's like it's really interesting because i do think you know there's a line in here that i th- found that was really interesting is like i don't think i'm a great artist but i think i make pretty good stories you know and and mm-hmm. i think there's always been this this thing that king has where he kind of agrees with the sentiment that like there's there's literature and then there's horror fiction and and the type of stuff he's doing right like he he kind of would agree with the fact that these these are different buckets and he's not saying that like one bucket is inherently more valuable than the other i think it's the exact opposite but there always has been i feel like a chip on his shoulder around this idea that you know the the cho- the chosen genre and the chosen type of novel he's he's made his career in is is never going to be like considered like great literature or whatever um and i i just find that really fascinating because it's not that i'm saying like i disagree with him but i don't know i i feel like he does have a little bit of a chip on his shoulder yeah it's interesting to me um because you you're probably right i mean i think you know him better than than i do just having followed his career for longer. So Mm. you're probably right. Um, I almost have like a vicarious chip on my shoulder because, and this goes all the way back to like people ragging on like George R. R. Martin and, and other sort of popular writers and basically deriding them as, as like trash writers who, who were, you know, not worth consideration and that you're basically a child for reading their, their books, et cetera, et cetera. And I always had the position of like, I, I think I I think that you know your George R. R. Martins and your Stephen Kings, when they like slow down and are super careful, they can actually write literature. It's just that a lot of the time, they back in the day for George R. R. Martin um, and for King's career, they want to write something more quickly because they're trying to pay the bills, um, yeah. and and also they're trying to like they're trying to write something good and solid and entertaining. It doesn't have to be Moby Dick. Um, they're not aiming for the same target. It's just a different sort of thing. Yeah. It's uh it's just a different objective. And and they are better at that than Proust is at writing entertaining fiction, right? <laughs> like like yeah. th- th- they they just they are actually masters at that specific art form, the art form of writing entertaining stories, right? Yeah. Literature is not often purpose to entertain right and and like that's that's the cool thing about short stories is short stories can be like just like just this like package of entertainment sure um, yeah. I, yeah i just think it's really interesting that like he like I, he he has a chip on his shoulder and i think in many ways he he chipped it himself because like i think it's really interesting that in this thing he says i'm no great artist like he's saying like he is dividing the line between what is what is art in fiction 
and what is and what he's doing right like he's making that dividing line and i think a lot of that is is maybe and again i'm psychoanalyzing i don't like doing this but like maybe just a base level of insecurity about the stories we're about to be talking about in that i mean and we have to remember the context of this is these were stories written for magazines for for men's magazines specifically uh-huh. right like this is for a very specific type of audience <laughs> it's a very specific type of story like y- y- your goals here are to get in to creep someone out and maybe titillate them a little bit and then move on with your life right that's that's the goal that's that's the the point of this little story and so i think maybe like a, a lot of this forward reads to me as like he's like trying to predict criticism before it happens um which yeah. I, I find really fascinating or or maybe just kind of set your expectations a little bit yeah no that's that's totally fair but i and, and despite all this i think he writes so elegantly on you know the idea of fear and what horror does and why we like it and and the psychology of humanity and why we like these stories and you know the, I, we haven't covered it and i've talked about it before but the there's there's the the horror you know cinema and novel nonfiction book he wrote uh dance macabre um which is just phenomenal i really recommend listeners out there if you haven't read that that book it's just him for like 400 pages talking about horror it's in a similar way that he talks about it here in this forward uh it, it's really 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 great and i wish like he would do an update on it because that came out in the early 80s and i wish he'd do an update on it about the changes in horror over the last few decades um but man um I, i've gone off topic here but i just i, I find this forward really, really fascinating in it from from several different angles Sure. No, it makes sense. It's valuable to read like his own philosophy as he approaches mm-hmm. this stuff. Um, yeah. M- maybe, you know, if there's any other, I-, I would like to talk about Don's Macabre with you at some point, actually, like that well, would be a great topic. I agree. Well, we will find a way. Well, I mean, you know, remember, um, I, I had a whole idea to do a whole show on that called Don's P- Pod Cobb. And then <sighs> you said that was a terrible name and you made fun of me publicly about it. And <laughs> I've lost all confidence in it since then. Huh. And I'll never I, uh, truly recover. Huh. I don't remember that at all, but it's good to see that it's been preying on you. <laughs> Look, it's very possible that this is all in my head. And you just said like, and you, you know what it is? It's probably, you just didn't laugh forcefully enough when I made the joke. And that's, I, I inserted all that stuff after that. Cause that's how my brain works. Uh, well, this version of Matt right now, who is real <laughs> thinks that that would be a good idea. I mean, because there's a lot of the the cool thing about that book is it it references a lot of horror novels and horror movies, uh, many of which you and I have not read or seen. So it would be cool to talk about King talking about those novels and then revisit them ourselves. This is a great idea. One of several thousand that we have. Um, But but we got to get through this book first, Matt. All right, let's do that then. So let's do it. Half an hour into the show. Let's talk about our first of five short stories. Sounds good. Uh, All right. So our first story this week is Graveyard Shift. This was, as we said, originally published in the 1970 October issue of Cavalier, a men's magazine that was in the 50s, 60s and 70s. Um, You know, typical to what you see. Not this is not a a, a full blown porno mag, but there are definitely scantily clad women on the cover to make men go, ooh, and then uh, and then read some some spooky stories. Yeah, that's what men like is is. Boobies and spooky stories, apparently. That's, I mean, the only two things, actually. We're not, yep. we're not complicated. Yep. <laughs> All right. In the story, we meet a young drifter named Hall who is working the graveyard shift, a small main textile mill. Uh, I'm imagining, Matt, by the way, a, a person who has never read Stephen King before in his life picks up this short story collection, opens it up, reads the first story, which is Jerusalem's Lot, then comes in and reads the second story, which is Graveyard Shift, and is like, man. This guy has got something going on for rats, doesn't he? Because <laughs> these are yeah. two stories at the beginning of the thing that are predominantly focused on rats. I I, I remember thinking that that was funny um, <laughs> because I actually read this story back when I read uh, Jerusalem's Lot. And so I reread it for this, obviously. <gasps> um, cheated. You, you already knew this because we talked about it on that episode. Um, I don't um, remember things. I I know that, but I went back and re-listened to that episode because oh, so you and, don't and, remember it either. You just no, I don't. I don't remember it either. I just had to listen to. I don't remember. That's why I podcast is so I can have a memory. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the the it is funny to have put these two stories back to back. 
I, I think it's interesting also because like rats don't really bother me. Actually, like no, no, I'm not don't really have any animal phobias at all. Um, so it's interesting. Like stories like this are interesting because I don't like you know when when King starts describing you know rats. Rats the size of cats, rats the size of Rottweilers, rats the size of tapers. Um, I, I'm just like, okay, like, I, I guess that would be bad if you ran across one of those. But it doesn't really scare me. Like, do you think rats really get to Stephen King? Do you think that's why he does this? Yeah, I think they do a little bit. Um, I think, like, the, the, for me personally, the thing about rats that I don't like is not, like, like if I just see a rat sitting there, I'm not going to freak out about it. And, like, the the mutant rats that we see in this story don't really bother me at all. But, like, the 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 noises and the scratching in the walls part mm-hmm. that I think is, is so predominantly featured in, in Jerusalem's lot. And then, like, the, the, you know, digging through some trash and having one, like, jump out and bite at you, that part, like, sufficiently creeps me out so like it's not the rat itself it's just the 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 presence of many many rats like just outside of your field of vision is the part that freaks me out sure and i'm sure if i had a rat on me suddenly i would like (laughs) flip out completely it's just like yeah reading about it doesn't really do the same thing for me so i mean what do you think of the story as a whole um this is a you know an interesting one. I think we should say at the top here, this is heavily Lovecraftian inspired. Um, I, I don't think either of us have read the story. Well, that's not true. I don't know if that's true. I have not read the story that this is inspired by the Lovecraft story. I don't know if you have. Yes, I, I did. Um, and I'll probably be mentioning it a, a bit because uh, I believe that this story, uh, it's called The Rats in the Walls. The Lovecraft story is called The Rats in the Walls. And I, I'm pretty sure that it inspired both this story and also Jerusalem's Lot to a degree because they have very similar themes and uh, this idea of like going underground and finding this area that should not be there and there's giant rats and so forth. Very, very reminiscent of that um, short story. Uh, I, I kind of gotcha. don't want to spoil it actually though. It's it's like really <laughs> interesting and horrible. Um, so go read Okay, that's Lovecraft fine. Story. I need I need to read some Lovecraft. We're gonna have to do some Lovecraft content at some point. I mean, despite the guy for for all intents and purposes being a giant asshole, um, it's it's worth yeah. reading. I think. But he's he's dead. So so Sir. none of our none of your money goes to him now. So don't worry about it. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So so this story, you know, I think it's really interesting. So you know, I, this is one of those things that like I was thinking about this story before we we started this project and I was like thinking what the fuck are we going to talk about in the story where some guys just go into a basement and then they see a bunch of mutant rats and then they eat them the end like what what do we have to talk about in this thing and then I started reading the story and I was absolutely fascinated by this thing that I think maybe largely doesn't fully come together for me there's there's moments in this thing where I'm like huh but but it is really remarkable to me that I think King is doing something more than just, Hey, this is a spooky story about guys who have to go clean out a a rat nest. Um, And I think one of those things is our, our kind of main central conflict here, because at the beginning, our our main character hall is approached by a man named Warwick, who is the foreman of the mill. And we see immediately that he does not like this guy at all. And, and really the, the main antagonist protagonist conflict of the story is between these two guys. Um, And I think, you know, the rats themselves, even the giant, gross, legless queen mutant rat we'll see in a few pages is really just kind of doing its thing. And and really all the disgusting and the nastiness and the horror on display here seems to be the result of human intervention, the result of like industry and choices humanity is making specifically. And I don't know, that's really, really interesting, actually, right? Yeah, um, it, it absolutely is uh i i guess so so i was kind of um metabolizing all of that stuff in the lens of like we know that king worked at some horrible laundry when he was young Mm -hmm. and i'm pretty sure he did also work in a textile mill at some point too yeah uh i i I don't know about that actually i'll take your word for it um and, and sorry, I guess, I guess I mentally mashed together the the idea of a laundry and a textile mill because we have a story about a laundry and a, and, and this story, yeah. but 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 basically just like working these 
these shitty jobs involving lots of cloth and and <laughs> chemicals and mm-hmm. um and like manually schlepping around chemicals and cloth and watching it like spill and probably there being rats and probably there being all kinds of like gross stuff that he had to deal with and and, and as he's doing all these terrible jobs he has this creative mind he's concocting these horrible scenarios um and 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 like this is the story that falls out of that right that is, is this idea that like you just said like all of the waste and, and and like cheapness and stupidity of the job like sinks down into the earth and gives birth to something nightmarish or something along these lines yeah i mean the the basement they're going to clean like the things that they're cleaning out of the basement is not like nature and like like mm-hmm. it, 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 and like the existence of the rats here are predicated on the fact that there's just a bunch of gross industrial waste and shit around everywhere like like this part here they were stacked like link sausages in long rows some of them especially the discontinued meltons and irregular shapes for which there were no orders years old and dirty gray with industrial waste they made fine nesting places for the rats huge fat bellied creatures with rabbit eyes and bodies that jumped with lice and vermin you know so like yeah, the rats are gross and disgusting, but they're here because of all this gross waste. And the, the 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 basement is just like like just a bunch of office shit that people just left there for 12 years to rot and it just culminated in all this stuff. So I think there is a lot of you know critique of industry going on here actually. Yeah, I think you're right. Um I don't know that 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 jumped out to me consciously while I was reading, but I totally agree with your reading there. Um Sure. But one thing that I don't really get, so you pointed out the animosity between Hall and Warwick is like the focal point of the story, sort of. Um, But I don't really understand it. And I guess I'm just going to say that now. And then maybe like you can explain something to me as we're going or something else will jump out. But like (laughs) other than just like Hall just doesn't like this guy because he's a prick. Like, like, yeah. Is it as simple as that? And, and I'm, and I'm looking for something deeper that isn't there. Yes and no. I, I'm sorry, I don't have like the magic answer for you that's going to make this all clear to you. This is one of the things that I, that if I had to critique the story, that would be one of the things I said. Is, is I'm not sure that all comes together because yes, he does not like him, and and it is very understandable for a a blue collar, you know, hourly wage worker to not like the foreman, right? Especially when the foreman is kind of a prick, like, like Warwick is, is characterized to be here, but it goes beyond that, right? Because it it goes, you know, we're jumping ahead here, but like he finishes his first graveyard shift doing the cleaning in the basement. And, and he's like having these thoughts about like how the rats and the foreman are somehow connected. And I just get this overwhelming feeling that this is all connected and, and he and I are tied together in some way. And I really think what this is broadly trying to do is bring this sense of, of otherworldly cosmic dread. You know, it's trying to capture the Lovecraftian nature of it, but it just, I don't know. It just doesn't, it doesn't work for me. I really, because I'm just like, what? Like yeah. ha- how, what do you, what do you mean? And then like Hall's behavior at the very end of the story is just gets me to go like, why are you doing this actually? Uh-huh. Like, have you been possessed? Like what, what, what is going And maybe I'm trying to find uh, the literal in, in the metaphorical here or in just the, in the tone that King is going for here. I'm trying to find a literal rational explanation for this in which, in, in which there is none, but it, it just, it just left me feeling like, huh? what yeah well it left me feeling like i was missing something like i had missed Mm -hmm. like i had misunderstood something or or that i had overlooked something that i was supposed to have gotten um because you expect there to be a twist right when you have that or 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 reveal when you have that kind of setup those kind of breadcrumbs Mm -hmm. you expect there to be a reveal that's like i don't i i I don't know like something weird something horrifying some some realization that that Warwick and, and Hall actually have some shared past yeah. that they that that Warwick that, that like Hall Hall's narration has been hiding from us until this moment, but we get none of that and and I, I like the only the only thing I could even think of that makes any sense, which really I, I don't like I don't find satisfying is like this is almost a Telltale Heart scenario where we're just kind of watching Hall lose his mind, and mm-hmm. there is no 
like there is no underlying truth it's just him becoming paranoid and, and insane um yeah. but that's not satisfying to me so i I, re- I just don't know yeah i mean there is there is a moment where i think he like i don't remember exactly when this happens but he's down there in the basement with the giant mutant rats and he said something like ah this is what my my searching and wandering has been for all along you know like mm-hmm. hall's actually just this really interestingly drawn character in the story i think because you know we learn he's a college he's college educated um and and then he's he's a drifter right he's just kind of wandering around the country going from job to job and the book the short story rather doesn't really fill in the blanks between those things you know like what happened to make him drop out what happened to make him just decide he's just going to kind of wander around without purpose just taking jobs as he can and then leaving after he gets bored of them there there's a there's a missing beat there and so it it leaves you with some uh, and a a not completely clear picture of who this person is which which i think is is kind of intentional i think but also lends a little bit of confusion in, in exactly the way you're talking about here this is one of those places where i am willing to sort of extend the generosity of just saying okay and that's what this short story is is it's it's weird and confusing and it leaves you with this unsettled feeling of puzzlement and and like you like you missed something Mm -hmm. um and maybe that's like part of the design you know maybe he meant for you to leave it feeling like what the hell is going on with that (laughs) like that's a i mean at least that's an interesting thought to me yeah so we kind of jumped all around there but i think there are some beats that i would i would like to to hit before we move on from the story a little bit sure um because there's there's uh, there's some really interesting stuff with his his partner so so basically hall uh is asked to kind of help clean out this old basement that hasn't been touched in in 12 years um the plant is shutting down for the fourth of july week which by the way um this is something that really dates the story because there's just no way a textile plant in 2023 shuts down for an entire week for the 4th of July. There's just no way that happens. Uh-huh. The workers would get a day if that. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Right. Um, anyway. So, uh, <laughs> so Hall is at, is, is basically told he'll get bonus pay if he comes and helps do this thing and he agrees to it and he gets partnered with this man, this, this King character named Wisconsin, which is just, just a delightful name as well. Um, King describes him as enormously fat, enormously lazy, and enormously gloomy. Um, and and I, f- I find this character so interesting because this is one of those things that I think even here early in King's career, this is one of those things that separates these kind of stories from the way other people would write them. Because, you know, as we said, this is just a story about a guy, you know, going into a basement and getting eaten by rats. But we slow roll that so much and we have several scenes and moments with this random King character um who is just kind of a, a bit of a whiny asshole actually yeah yeah wisconsin is your classic bizarre stephen king character who you could totally believe exists um if not on this earth then on some level of the tower for yeah. sure I, I definitely think king had to like work with a guy like this in one of his odd jobs and was like i fucking hated that guy let's throw him <laughs> in this thing for sure there's a thing worth talking about with him, though, because there's a three beat in the story, a very, very quick three beat because it's a short story. But one of the things he says over and over again, three times, actually, as they're cleaning is this ain't no work for a man. And I think the the text really emphasizes the fact that over and over again, he's saying, you know, this this the type of work we're doing here. No man should be should doing this work. What What do you think about that? I can't say that it really uh, jumped out to me at the time, but since you're putting it to me, I, I do uh, think about the possible connections to uh, the, the rats in the walls, the Lovecraft story, um, and sort of, you know, analogously the connections to Jerusalem's Lot, um, where like in Jerusalem's Lot, it's it's not rats in the walls, it's zombie vampire revenants in the walls. Um, and, and so, and, and also in the rats in the walls, there's a kind of paralleling between rats and humans that mm-hmm. I won't, I won't go into to avoid spoiling, but like by saying this ain't no work for a man, it's, it's sort of drawn. I, I, I find myself thinking about a kind of either a parallel or a contrast between rats and people. The text itself sort of offers that comparison a few times. 
in the text, like comparing the rats to a jury at one point. Um, but I don't know that this one, this one thing with this story and some of the other stories in this collection, I think is I'm, I'm just like, ah, I don't know, man, that's, that's, I, I'm saying it, it's coming out of my mouth, but it sounds a little thin. Sure. No, that, that, that's fair. Um, yeah. And, and I don't, <laughs> I, I, the, the reason I posed this question to you is because I really wasn't sure if I knew the answer to it myself. Um, I, I do like the idea of ma- drawing lines between rats and men and, and, and the ways in which, you know, I, I think there's, there's ways in which the story like shows the men as kind of cruel and monstrous to each other. Um, and the rats are just like, I, I'm thinking of the bit where, you know, the rats are just watching Hall work at some point and it, the text describes them as kind of a jury judging yeah. him, right? That there's right. this, there's these things going on and these animals are just kind of judging humanity for the behavior they're having here. And so this idea that, that, um, you know, that this, this central idea that, again, to talk about industry and to talk about, you know, the type of work this is, maybe Wisconsin even through his complaining is making a point about like, this is what people are doing. Like this is no, no human being should have to do this stuff we're doing right now. Um, and yet, yeah. yet we find that we are. It's, it's interesting to think like, you, you know, the saying shit rolls downhill. Mm-hmm. Um, like here, here Hall finds himself like two levels above the bottom, metaphorically speaking. And one level below him is like the basement that's full of rats And then one level below the rats is like the mutant horrifying rats. Mm -hmm. But like everything's getting like washed downstream into this, into this metaphysical gutter. Um, And he's just one step above it. And and then we watch him kind of fall into it in this book. Yeah. Um, And, and so that's the idea is that we're all, we're all like in, in tears, just kind of barely keeping our heads above the level of rats um, at, as we, as we, you know, degrade or something like that i like that and part of me that really likes the image that connects with that with me is when they do find this trap door in the basement that leads down to the sub basement it's locked from the other side right Mm -hmm. it's it's like we're keeping you out of here actually Mm -hmm. like the the, rather than trying to keep what's in there it, it locked in uh which is a really fascinating twist on this whole idea that like you know you you belong there not down here and we're gonna we're gonna keep you out of here uh, yeah rather than than you keeping what's in there out and and this is this is full galaxy brain but if you think like who locked that door from the from the other side like Uh did rats lock that door or were they not rats yeah, I don't know. I mean, we saw, we saw the bones of one person, I think. They saw, like, the bones of a corpse. So, like, okay. the, the rational read of this could just be, oh, that guy, like, stumbled down here, found this, and said, oh, my God, we have to prevent these people from getting out. So I'm, I am I can't get out myself, so I'm going to lock them in here with me. But I like the read <laughs> that's actually, no, just the mutant rats said, we don't want these fucking pieces of shit people coming down here and messing with their shit. So let's keep yeah. them out of here and let's lock them out. I, I do like that. I mean, that I, the reason I like that is that this is kind of my favorite thing about this story overall is, is like, like I said a minute ago, the idea, like the idea of seeing a rat doesn't fill me with dread or whatever, mm-hmm. but like there is something kind of intrinsically spooky about rats, which, which is that like the, the abstract idea of a rat is that it's like this tiny intelligent being that lives in our shadows and lives in the, in the cracks and corners under our world and it like they're watching us Mm -hmm. we don't know they're watching us but they're watching us and like what if what if they hate us (laughs) like what if they what if you know like doesn't isn't that a much creepier thought than just like oh no shit there's a rat right it's it's more metaphysical and and like otherworldly um yeah well there's a wonderful line in the story that's like um you know one of the people musing like what if we they were the big ones and we were the small ones uh yeah Um, and and the story kind of is able to capture that a little bit i like this a lot because here's and this is going to be a freaking stretch so bear with me here um the, the story opens up with hall kind of just sitting around um he doesn't have any work to do at the moment because 
I think it's Wisconsin is not doing his job and, and he's rolling down the assembly line. And so he's just sitting there and the foreman comes up and bugs him. And the whole time the foreman's there, he's like, can't you just fucking go back into your office and just r- do whatever the fuck you do in there and leave me the fuck alone? And and what is what is the ending of the story if not the rats being like, can't you just leave us the fuck alone uh-huh. <laughs> just go back go back on your level and leave us the fuck alone we're doing our sh- our thing down here you're doing your thing up there leave it leave us alone go away uh-huh. foreman and the foreman doesn't go away and so they you know eat eat, eat them yeah so really this is all this is a story about micromanaging obviously yeah. holy shit scott you've nailed it you've cracked we it cracked. right open <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a story about having a manager that you really don't like, and then and then, but there's like it, there's, it's it's like parasite, you know. Mm-hmm. There's there's like a level below it. Yeah, it's great. It's great. So yeah, so that so that is what happens in the story. They find this trap door. Uh, I really do think it's really fascinating the way this works with the, with the decision to go down and investigate, though, Matt, because in a typical story of this kind. That is supposed to be like, oh, the this the blue collar worker dealing with this shitty boss. They would discover the trap door, and the shitty boss would be like, Hall, you go down there. I command you as your employer to go down into the shitty place. Do it. But th- in the story, it's actually the exact opposite, right? Where where uh, the the foreman is immediately like, Hey, we were told to clean this level. I'm not. I don't have to worry about any of that shit. We're not going down there. And Hall is like, no, no, no. If you don't do that, I'm going to narc on you to the the town and they're going to make you go down there and clean it up. And you'll also probably lose your job and all this stuff. And so Hall forces the foreman to ha- let them investigate and then is kind of roped into doing it himself, which is such an interesting twist on what you think you would see in this type of thing. Yeah, I agree. And uh, again, don't quite know what to do with it. It's like suddenly Hall cares a lot about the the justice of the situation mm-hmm. um, or, or else he's just using it as a weapon against against his boss. But, yeah, I mean, um, I guess if I again, a, a small critique, because overall I enjoy the story. I just feel like like I understand why Hall doesn't like him for sure. I just feel like I don't know if the level of his animosity is really well enough defined for me because like I, I wish there was more of a through line to understand why he would like seize upon this moment to be like ah this is it i'm gonna fucking get him this is my opportunity to fuck this guy up and and you know leave him for dead which ultimately like gets him killed as well right that's that's the, that's the most confusing part of the ending is like had you just already given up on being alive? Like, were you just like, I'm going to take this guy out even if it cost me my life? Or did Hall legitimately think he could get back to the trap door in time? I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. You know, it, it's so funny that this story reminds me so much of this one particular so-called writer's story where <laughs> like the point of it is actually just that the character has lost his mind. Mm-hmm. And, and, but like I, I, in that story, I felt like I made that pretty clear. Whereas I feel like, if it was clear one way or the other, if Hall had just snapped, then I would I would know at least. But mm-hmm. as it is, I'm just like I I don't I don't understand why he's doing any of these things. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I and, I don't know. And I like the story. I really do. I enjoy it. Yeah. It was fun to read. It's just when you really start picking at it, where you're just like, yeah, I just there's a lot of fun, interesting ideas in here. I mean, honestly, let's be honest here. It feels like the story of a very young man. 1970. King was. I think that's the year he graduated from college. So he was 21, right? 22, maybe. Um, that's, a, that's a very young young man. Yeah. Sure. No. So yeah, he I, just I, hadn't refined his skills yet. The thing, the thing that I love about this, though, the thing that I love about reading these, these early stories is you can see the guy there, right? Like you can see the Stephen King there that we have been talking about glowingly for years now. Um, it, it's there. It's just a little rougher. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, and and again, I, I I know we nitpicked a bit here, but like I actually did enjoy the stuff. I enjoyed all the stories. We're, we're going to probably nitpick almost all these, but I enjoyed all of them. I thought they were fun. Mm-hmm. Um, they they all kind of left me with a little kind of shard of something stuck in my brain for me to kind of sure, sure. think about later. Um, and in that sense, they're they're actually super valuable and successful. It's it's just like the short story medium is weird. Um, yeah. Yeah, let's let's let, let's move let, on let, to the next one. Yeah, yeah, well, and let's forgive ourselves for being critical too. Yeah, and, and I think critical, like to to a very loose 
extent, right? Like, I think yeah. I agree with you. Overall, I enjoyed every single one of these stories. Um, one, one final sentence, actually. Like, are, are the bats actually bats or are the bats uh, rats that you're turning into bats? I don't know, man. <laughs> the, the, the only reason I ask is there's like one sentence where it's like one bat that hadn't lost its tail is referenced. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I mean, yeah, they could probably just be mutant rats, right? I think that, yeah. that makes sense. I think okay. that's a fun kind of twist on the idea because I think one of the characters says kind of jokingly is like, but what are bats but just rats with wings? And yeah. then it'd be fun if that's just literally what happened to some of them grow wings. Because, I mean, you think about it, like the the, the super big mutant ones have lost their hind legs. Yeah. I'm just like, that's not practical. Uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, maybe it is for like the queen one because she doesn't really have much to do but just chill there for a while but like i don't know it just seems like even though you're underground and it's dark like you would still want to like move around or or just like what are they eating in the first place is is yeah. something that the book has no interest in in telling us and so you know sure Each other. yeah yeah right <laughs> all right matt let's move on to our second story all right Let's talk about Night Surf. Um, So this story was first published in the spring 1969 issue of Ubris, uh, which is, as we said at the beginning, the University of Maine Literary Journal, meaning that uh, this this story was published um, while King was still in college. I think this was his junior year of college that he wrote and got the story published in his literary magazine. Good job, Stevie. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, oh, this, this story is so fascinating to me. It's, I mean, obviously the big kind of selling point of the story from our perspective is, oh my God, it's the stand, right? This is a story about Captain Tripp's written a a decade before King published the stand. And obviously you can tell just by reading the story that in that uh, intervening time, King changed his mind about Captain Tripp's a bit. Um, There's, there's, there's details and bits that are are different. Um, I think in the night surf version, it seems like, humanity hangs around for a little while longer like it feels like months have gone by since the the outbreak whereas um in uh in in the stand it was basically like over in a week right yeah or it feels but, like a more natural flu epidemic really yeah 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 but this one i don't know like i, I think there's a lot of imagery here but i think the story kind of left me feeling a little bit cold how, how about you yes it it uh to me it's more of a scene or or like a moment or, or or an idea that kind of struck King and he wanted to capture mm-hmm. it. Uh, it's more it's more something like like a vibe than it is a story. Sure, sure. Um, for some reason, I kept thinking about some of the short fiction of F. Scott Fitzgerald that I've read, specifically in its kind of narrativelessness and reliance on the reader to kind of be willing to read between the lines. Sure. And its focus on like the character's interiority, uh, and and it just kind of is that right. Like we're just kind of swimming around in this character's point of view, and his thoughts as he bumps around and thinks about the last few hours of his life, and that's it. That's the story. The end. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. Uh, and there are remarkably effective passages, but it, it it's really it's really interesting. I mean, uh, the 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 main character is a, a a kid named Bernie and he kind of sucks like a lot. Like he uh-huh. treats like, I mean, there's, there's uh, over one of the biggest recurring beats of the story is how absolutely cruel he is to this girl, Susie, who he describes very unflatteringly, both physically and, and just her whole personality uh, over and over again. And they have this really violent, horrible relationship between the two of them. Um, and it's really interesting that like King chose to write this story about this, this it's, it's the end of the world. It's, it's a group of people that have survived the end of the world, or at least they thought they were. And, and maybe they're actually in their last moments now as well. And they all just kind of suck. And it's like, you know, it, it causes you to sit back and be like, why would you do that? Right. Why would you make basically every single one of these characters? It's just a piece of shit actually. Yeah. I don't, um, I don't know at all actually like it it feels like maybe obviously uh there are some seeds of the stand here Mm -hmm. and maybe there's some of the sorts of stuff that we end up seeing in in the vegas um axis of of humanity in the stand and i I sincerely doubt that he had like the whole cosmology of like 
you know, Randall Flagg and, and darkness and the white and everything in mind when he wrote this short story, but maybe some vestige of like these kind of people yeah. be, as, as being a kind of nexus of something that he wanted to articulate specifically. Yeah. I mean, maybe just like literally using, um, using the idea of the apocalypse and, and an and end of world epidemic type situation as a way of examining um, the worst that humanity has to offer. And, and I mean, maybe, maybe that's unfair because I mean, these people are kind of just mean to each other and shitty and yeah, they burn a guy alive, but like there's, there's, we've seen much more monstrous like King characters. And like, I think actually there's going to be, <laughs> there's going to be a character this week in one of these stories that I think is, is a worse piece of shit than some of these characters. I agree. Um, but you know, just just to kind of examine kind of the 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 natural shittiness of humanity, because like yeah. one of the things we see here is, you know, the, the story starts the hook of the story. The first line of the story is after the guy was dead and the smell of his burning flesh was off the air. We went back down to the beach and that's like a what? And we realize that what they did is they just found a guy infected by the flu and they just they just burned him alive. Um, uh -huh. And they didn't do it because like, like it started off as a joke. They said that's like, Oh, they heard like, you know, they heard that like you could offer, you know, sacrifices to the gods and they would be kind to you. And it says specifically like, um, n none of, none of, uh, uh, we didn't like believe that, that any of that was going to work, but it was just something to do. <laughs> It was a yeah. new thing to do. And finally we went ahead and did it. So that's, the, that's the opening thing is that like, they just found the sick guy, they were bored. And so they just lit him on fire and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And that really is kind of the axis that the story revolves around, despite the mm -hmm. fact that the story kind of seems to move on from it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's sort of is the, is the thing that matters. And, you know, you, you kind of pointed it out to me actually, caused me to realize that this story has like seven different parallels to Lord of the Flies where, <laughs> where, you know, we have this fixation on like the smell of, of the human smelling like pork and in Lord of the Flies, we have the whole thing with like the pig mm -hmm. uh, and the mm -hmm. character of piggy and, and pigs, pigs everywhere. Uh, you know, we've got a beach setting. Um, we've got the, uh, the, maybe the most important parallel, which is that this is indeed about, what these really young people get up to when civilization is ripped away. Yeah. And, and like they're that. just like, cause I don't even actually think that this guy is like the worst guy. I think, I think that he, like the world died around him and, and everything lost all possible meaning. And he's just stuck with these people who he just happened to be stuck with. Yeah. Everybody he's ever loved is dead. And now he's just absolutely fallen into pure nihilism and, and the, where we're, we're burning a guy alive is just like a way to pass the time. Um, and that to me is like the most Lord of the flies thing ever. Uh, so, so now I'm, yeah, now I'm definitely thinking about this as like a Lord of the flies sort of um, inspired. I, I really piece. like this because we know how much King is, is obsessed with Lord of the flies. Right. And it is, yeah. it, it, you're absolutely right that it is like, you know, we use the pandemic to explore what, what the lack of civilization will do to people. And yeah, we see that these people are, I, I like that, you know, not specifically evil, not specifically monstrous. And it is, it is kind of an interesting reflection of the stand because I think the stand was trying to show like actual, you know, the, the difference between good and evil and how people like find themselves on either side of that conflict. Whereas here, these people are not in any kind of conflict between good and evil. They're just hanging out. And, and we see just the, 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 the normal kind of mundane brutality that will come from a, a, a human being who has been removed from the rules of society and civilization. Yeah, exactly. And I, I like, yeah. I like that about it, right? Like even yeah. all the stuff I said about it, not really being a story, it's like what it is, is it's almost more, more in the space of a, you know, poetic piece where it conveys what it needs to convey. It doesn't really need to have a narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, man, it, it's, it's so interesting because like, I, I think we've been very positive on it so far and I, I think that's, that's fair, but it, it, it is, it is this, this kind of tone poem that 
you know, has these beautiful passages. Like I love the description of the beach. You know, they like our character kind of, you know, gets to the top of a dune and looks out over the empty beach and like says, I've always, I always, every time I get here, I have to pause and look at the beach, but I've never seen it like this because the, the stain of humanity has kind of ripped all those pieces away. And all that's left is like the beach and the surf, the night surf throwing up bursts of foam. And it's just like beautifully, you know, tragic and, and evocative description of, of the world mixed in with these just great awful people <laughs> yeah yeah no I, I agree like the the uh, juxtaposition of this beautiful image of or this you know harrowingly beautiful image of like how fast all traces of humanity were washed away yeah with with just like some really petty <laughs> shitty stuff that this guy is saying and thinking mm-hmm. um it, it gives you really interesting feeling um yeah just on that specifically like i i did feel like insofar as we want to make stand connections that bernie is a bit of a prototype for harold louder um yeah i could see that you know at, at least in the way that he kind of views women um oh yeah i mean that that definitely true yeah um i think harold takes a lot longer to get to a point where he's like actively antagonistic with them whereas bernie seems like he's just there <laughs> from the beginning yeah. like He's just, he's so mean to this Susie girl. Like one of the, th- the things that I find fascinating about this is like, there's, there's little hints and, and, and bits that like, uh, that King is implying that Susie kind of likes being treated this way. And that actually like the, the, the burning of the guy was like titillating for her a little yeah. bit, which is, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I'm like, can I rely on the narrator that this is accurate or does he just really hate this woman? And is so is painting her in this very negative light. Um, and, and, and she doesn't seem that annoying. Like she's just like, "Hey, I'm it. The world has ended. And I'm terrified. Just tell me you love me." And he's like, "Oh, she's sure getting fat, huh?" And that's like, like his he's fixated on her size, which is really actually interesting because in one of the scenes where he's like looking at stuff and remembering his time here at this beach, you know, back before civilization ends, he reminds he reminds himself of a time with a different girl that he brought here, and he says in the in the thing, "Oh, she's bigger too." So like. I don't, I don't know. Like in one case it's like disgusting, but he's remembering the other girl fondly. So I don't know. I think Bernie is just a jerk. <laughs> yeah. I think Bernie's, I think Bernie's just a jerk and Bernie's definitely being bothered by this. Is why I think of it as like Fitzgeraldian actually is like, he's super bothered by everything and like probably yeah. depressed and he's like unable to think about that. And so he's just fixating on how his girlfriend is fat. And it, it it's yeah. ve- like it's kind of obvious that he's not really he doesn't really care about her. He, it, it's like yeah. everything else that's bothering him, right? Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting because you said he was nihilistic, and I, and I agree with that. But it's it is interesting the ways in which he is very kind of reflective on all this stuff. Like this this chat between uh, Needles and Bernie is really interesting here, where. Uh, Needles says they're, they're talking about the guy that they burn and Needles says, I don't feel so bad. He said, in my mind, I mean, you though, you think about it a lot. I can tell. No, I don't. A lie. Sure you do. Like that guy tonight. You're thinking about that too. We probably did him a favor when you get right down to it. I don't think he even knew it was happening. He knew. He shrugged and turned on his side. It doesn't matter. And And that's interesting, right? Because Needles is the one being, I think, a little bit more nihilistic here, right? That, that like, Bernie seems to be saying, like he's saying he didn't know it was happening, and Bernie's like, no, 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 he he did. He he's not hiding from. Like mm-hmm. I guess the thing about Bernie is, Needles is trying to justify it, right? He's trying to rationalize it. Like, yeah, you know, we we did that guy a favor. Um, he was gonna die anyway. We did him a favor, and I don't think he even realized what was happening. Bernie has no, like, qualms or or he's he's not doing what what Jack Torrance does, which is which is narratize in his head to to come up with a reason for doing things he doesn't need to do that actually yeah yeah um i i agree maybe maybe uh, i kind of want to take back saying that he that he is that he is nihilistic it's more like almost he's trying to be nihilistic as a mm-hmm. as a way of of not having to feel these horrible things that are being caused by the situation that he's in yeah yeah um, I want to read this little bit um, here near the end as they're they're going up to the the side of the 
um, snack shack where they're going to be spending the night on the, the apartment above it. We get this. The stairs went up the side of the building, but I paused for just a minute to look in the broken window at the dusty wares inside that no one had cared enough about to loot. Stacks of sweatshirts, ants and beach, and a picture of a sky... W- Picture of sky and waves printed on front, glittering bracelets that would green the wrist on the second day, bright junk earrings, beach balls, dirty greeting cards, badly painted ceramic Madonnas, plastic vomit. So realistic. Try it on your wife. Fourth of July sparklers for a Fourth of July that never was. Beach towels with a voluptuous girl in a bikini standing amid the names of a hundred famous resort areas. Pennants, balloons, bathing suits. Like this idea that like he's just you know, pausing to look at the remnants of civilization, basically, right? Like these are things that have no inherent value in and of themselves, which is why they weren't looted, but represent humanity in a lot of ways. Like this Mm -hmm. is, this is the beach. This is what people did at the beach and it's gone now. Yeah. I love that. I agree. This is like that tone poem writing where Mm -hmm. it's, Mm -hmm. it's sweeping you up in these kind of nostalgic images and then, and then, you know, narratively reminding you hey this is all dead and gone and it's never coming back within the frame of the story sure um yeah it's great stuff so one thing i think is worth talking about here uh kind of as we finish up with the story is the structure of it because i think this is is really interesting the way in which king chooses to kind of roll information out to us like we said the the story starts with the hook of, of they said they set a guy on fire and and after after he had sufficiently burned they just head back to the beach and then the, the story kind of like slowly reveals what's happening um you know it's it's not until a few more pages that we reveal that everyone is dead Um, and everyone is dead because of a virus and the virus is called captain trips. And then eventually we learn that, you know, um, needles has captain trips. Uh, and so he's going to die. And then after that, I think near the very, very end of the story, it's revealed that these people thought they were immune because they got the a two versus the a six, which is trips, which is supposed to be, um, something that gave you immunity. If you got that and lived it like a, a less strong version of what Captain Trips eventually ends up being, uh, then you were immune to that more deadly virus and we're going to live. And uh, and, and the, the, the story ends on basically this idea that because Needles got it, um, that that's not true for them. And there is, uh, you know, the, do, they're doomed. And that's kind of how the story leaves us. But I think it's really interesting the way it rolls that information out to you, right? Because you, you don't even realize you're in a, a pandemic story until a few pages in. And then the significance of needles getting captain trips is kind of lost on you until you get to the end of that. I don't know. I just found the structure of this really interesting. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think in a short story, there's always, it's always important to get a really, to to land a really solid hook. So, Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. we, 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 uh, we kill the guy, uh, find out why on page six (laughs) is always, it's always a good hook. Uh, and then, and then, kind of threading the kind of emotional gut punch th- through things to kind of save that for later. Um, I think is, I, I agree. I mean, it's, it's. I think there were probably different ways to to do this, and I don't, you know, it. It not like I said. I still, I still don't really think that it works as like a, a narrative narrative. So, so you probably could have changed up the order of some of these things, and it probably would have been fine. Um, but I, I guess I. For what it was, I like the way he structured it and ordered things. Yes, yeah. yeah. Now, I like what you said about, you know, in the world of short stories, we have to play by different rules. And so we really don't have time to to pump you full of exposition at the beginning of the story. We need we need you into it. We need you invested right away. And we can sprinkle the, the what little exposition we have over the remainder of the story. And I think I think even even a young, young king recognizes that and in, in the way he structured this. Yeah, yeah, you got to be much more efficient uh, mm-hmm. in the short story. Yeah. All right, Matt, let's move on to our third story. Let's talk about I Am the Doorway. This was originally released in the March 1971 issue of Cavalier Magazine. Like half of these uh, stories were in Cavalier, Matt. I think this this magazine liked Stephen King quite a bit, actually. It's so funny because I never heard about it before this like conversation, but that's that's funny. I do think it's interesting that there is there has been something lost with this, right? Because, you know, there used to be a, a, a great many magazines and, and trades and things like that that just existed to publish short fiction or excerpts from novels in it. Like like and and that is 
gone now. I mean, you have like online, like you can have like, like fanzines and, and the things online, but like, and obviously publishing yourself is a lot easier, but there is no like place for like struggling writers to just send a bunch of short stories into places until some of them get published and they make a little bit of money and get by and then, and then also have another reference for their eventual publisher. Like it's just such a different world out there now. Yeah. I mean, even if some of these magazines still do exist, they, they aren't, they don't have the circulation and the readership that they did back then for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, it's just a totally different world now. You're right. Yep. So I am the doorway I think is probably, I think if I had to put it up against the other four stories we're talking about this week, probably the most fascinating to me out of the bunch. The others are like pretty simple, you know, spooky rats that eat you, spooky laundry machine that eats you, spooky boogeyman that eats you. But this feels like King very specifically going high concept. And I kind of dig it, man. I, I, I really like this story, actually. Yeah. I mean, all the other stories actually feel like Stephen King. And this one feels very different, it, mm-hmm. or, or at least it feels like King channeling a whole different set of influences, like like, sure. s- like s- you know sci-fi writers rather than his normal stable of of inspirations that he's tapping. Sure. Um, in particular, the bit where we cover Arthur's journey to Venus in in space, it just doesn't sound like King at all to me. Uh, <laughs> I think it's really interesting. It is real. I mean, the King has so rarely like delved into actual like science fiction stuff um, that, that the times we do it always feel um, uh, uh, surprising. Yeah. All right. Um, I think one critique I do have of the story before we get into it is King kind of does use his, you know, tried and true kind of foldable storytelling structure, which is where, you know, we start with people talking and then they eventually it transitions into one telling the other a story, which leads us to a flashback and it's, it's layered in this really interesting way. I I, I go back to the gunslinger where like (laughs) that book, the first part of it is actually like four layers deep of storytelling. Um, And I think in that book, it's very clear, like kind of what layer we on. I do think in this story, there were times for me and you know, I, I can maybe chalk this up to just bad reading, but there were times for me where I lost a little bit of, direction on where are we right now like is this there there was a moment where you know we're cutting between the first time he discovers the eyes and then he's talking to Richard again and then we cut back to you know for three weeks he did nothing about the eyes and and there was a a bit there I was like wait a minute is this after he talked to Richard and and dug up the boy's body or tried to find like I just I don't think that the story maybe did a good job of weaving the flashbacks in and out through the present events in a way that I could easily like follow the geography of it. It's just a a bit inelegant, I guess. I agree. Um, I forget, is it the tense or is it the first versus third person POV that shifts? Maybe both. Um, I have a note here in the text to, to check on this before getting to this part of the script. Yeah. I mean, it's in Um, first person. It's Um, in first person, but does it shift? I think the tense is what shifts, right? Because we're cause anyway. The yeah, point is, yeah. I found it very confusing. Similarly to to how you did, wasn't sure where we were in time or or you know what what is the anchor point, right? Like what is the present? This is one of those things where the the anchor point actually ends up being like, oh, he's writing a letter, yeah, from like the future about these things that happened. But then as he's telling you about these things that happened, he's then flashing back to an even more prior point in time, yeah, and you know this is this is a story that made a lot more sense on the second read through to be honest yeah and honestly the entire reason that i i bring it up here is because I, he he does this all the time these kind of nested structural situations and i just feel like every other time i've seen them in his writing it's been a lot clearer to me you know which which level which nest of that we're currently on and and this i kind of found myself losing it and having to like go back and reread yeah i I agree i don't i don't even i don't even think we need to say like this is a i think it's just a mistake right i think he just wasn't as good at this sort of thing at the time yeah i mean again this is a very very early story right he's still learning um and and uh, other than that i mean i think it's such a fascinating wonderful little story um I do want to point out that there's this other thing that occurred to me as I was reading this and it happens every time I read this book is that 
the last story we just read, Night Surf, primarily takes place on a beach. And then you turn the page and this story starts with two characters sitting at the golf, looking out at the water, primarily taking place on a beach. And it always kind of like threw my brain off because, you know, you have two stories back to back taking place on sand. And and my brain always for just the first couple pages has to be consciously reminded that this is a different story than that one. Actually, we've moved on from the 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 uh, uh, Captain Trips virus and are on a different thing now. And it's just I don't know. That's not a critique of the story or of the book at all. It's just funny that I I I have struggled with that every single time I've read these stories back That's, to back. That is funny. I mean, it, you're making me now wonder if some if like the sequencing of these stories wasn't intentionally designed to kind of do some some kind of match cuts between the ends of stories and the beginnings of the next ones. I think there might be something to that. I, I do because you know the Jerusalem's lot ends with him writing his last letter, saying there is something scratching in the walls again, and then we move into uh, we move into uh, uh, what is what is the name of the story we just talked about? Um, uh, graveyard shift. Graveyard shift. Yeah. Thank you. We move into graveyard shift, and then and then we have these two as well. So there might be something to that. I mean, I'm sure there is thought that goes into the order that we're going to put these stories into the collection, whether it's yeah. King making that decision or the editor making that decision. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you, you read, um, the illustrated man by the, the short story collection by the, by Ray Bradbury at some point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Doesn't it, doesn't everyone. Yeah. So like that, that's, that's one where <laughs> there's like the framing story of like, Oh, it's the tattoos of the man. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're all just different stories. But like anyway, it's it's a you know tried and true aspect of short story collections that there be some reason behind the way the stories are structured, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. And King has definitely played with that structure in some of his other collections. Um, I think it's less clear here, but I like I like that we're kind of maybe inadvertently discovering it here. Yeah, sure. So our story begins with our protagonist, Arthur. Again, this is a first person perspective, explaining to his friend Richard that he's killed a boy. So another story ends up with a, um, begins with a murder. Uh, there's going to be another one that does that as well. No, all of them, Matt. All of the stories <laughs> begin with the murder. Um, uh, that's funny. Yeah. He goes on to say rather that they did. We don't know who they is at the at the time, but he says that he is the doorway. What did you think of this this opening? Because I think there's this really interesting like thing at the beginning there, and at the very end of this opening section, it it says to us. Beneath the bandages, my new eyes stared blindly into the darkness the bandages forced on them. They itched. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like the entire story was built kind of for that that one moment at the end of the first section. Just like it's it's a, it's a really fun kind of immediate hook. It is. You know, I wish I could like just wholeheartedly love this story. But I have to say that the first read through of this story was was more confusing than than it was like hooky and, and and propulsive once i understood what the hell was going on um it landed a lot better like like so for example that passage you just read i love it now but the mm-hmm. first time i read it i think i just like parsed it wrong and, and i parsed it as like okay he's covered in bandages from head to toe and there's bandages covering his eyes and i don't even know if i like consciously registered the phrase new eyes like I, I, I may have, I don't remember. The, the the point of saying this is like, when when you're, you, you got it. You, I, I don't, I don't know exactly what I'm saying. I guess like you need you need to clarify things a little bit if you're going to be throwing in stuff like that. Maybe I don't know. I really like this story. Is is the funny mm-hmm. thing? I just like the first time through. I was so confused that I I legitimately didn't understand what's happening sometimes. Interesting. And I, I do think the part of what the story wants you to do is be confused a little mm-hmm. bit, mm-hmm. but I can tell, I mean, it, it, it's been so long since I read this for the first time. It didn't even occur to me that unless you are paying very close attention to my new eyes that you have might have no idea what that passage was talking about at all, at all. So yeah, yeah that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and this, this also is a minor quibble. It's a, I don't think Stephen King, with more experience would structure a sentence like this. And it, it, I didn't even, I literally did not even notice it until I just read it aloud a few minutes ago. But the, the sentence beneath the bandages, my new eyes stared blindly into the darkness, the bandages forced on them. Uh-huh. That, that's, that's not, that's not a great sentence. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. That's a, that's a little jumbled. Yeah. There's, there's too big. There's too many bandages in that sentence. 
Yeah. But I mean, this is fun because you can kind of see like, this is why I enjoy reading these super early stories because you can see the ways in which King was always King and just great in in the the things that he understands how to do. And then you can see the ways in which there's a little bit of of clunkiness at the beginning. Yeah. Clunkiness is the right word where it's just like, ah, I don't think that's how he would have done that today. Yeah. It's, it's not bad, but yeah, I think, today he would look at that sentence and go yeah that's not that's not a great sentence i could do that better yeah yeah so we learned that arthur now wheelchair bound and i handed uh (laughs) was was once an astronaut who traveled to venus as part of a last ditch effort by nasa to justify space travel i kind of love this putting this in context of the time you know we know this was published in 71 um in a world in which we've we've this world we've been to the moon we've been to mars and found nothing there was nothing useful found in either of those things nothing that that helped humanity at all and so it's fun to imagine a world two years after the moon landing when king is writing the story with people wondering like what 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 would be left for the space race like after you know we land on the moon we did it we won the space race uh what what are we going to do now? And two years later, King is is kind of thinking about this, which I'm sure was in the political conversation at some point in this this time period. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it it must have been it must have been funny the, the idea that that sci fi writers at that point in time would would actually be pessimistic, where it's like it's <laughs> like um in the middle of the space race to be like actually it's all going to turn out to have been for nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's great. I, I uh, one funny thing is that he references like. They went to Mars and, and they found nothing but struggling lichens. Um, and it's like, in reality, it's totally dead. <laughs> totally. <laughs> not not even lichens. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I like the, uh, I, I, I agree that it's fun to, to remember, you know, the, the time and place yeah. that this came out in. Yeah, I mean, you could just imagine like him reading news reports about like, because I mean, there like even even around the moon landing before we we did that, there was tons of opposition to how much money we were spending on the space race and whether this was a valuable use of resources and if we were getting something out of it so it's kind of fun to just imagine okay well we did that and we we got some stuff out of it we we, then and then in this world we also go to mars and so like venus is our last ditch effort we're going to go to venus we're going to see if we can get anything interesting there anything valuable there and if not uh nasa's kaput um which is basically what happens in the story yeah, yeah, you're right. So on their way back, something goes wrong and they end up totally crashing upon reentry. Uh, Arthur's co-astronaut dies in the crash and he is paralyzed. But obviously he gets, he brings something back with him, right? And I actually, I really love this because like the reason we're telling the story is Arthur is kind of like, I don't know, maybe I picked up some sort of like interstellar virus that was floating around venus or in the space between us and venus or not i don't know and i kind of love actually that king never answers this like is this where the eye is attached to him maybe maybe it was just randomly sitting on this this beach i i don't know i I like that it doesn't have an answer actually yeah yeah he also throws in the ambiguity that like they were broadcasting this signal into deep space and it could have yeah. something to do with that maybe but he never mm-hmm. answers it it's n- nothing even nothing even leaning in the direction of an answer and i agree with you totally it really shows that king gets it he gets mm-hmm. that you don't want to actually tell the reader this kind of thing you want it to be mysterious and weird yep. Yep. and that's like my favorite thing about the story totally totally uh, all right. I, I, I love, um, by the way, the other thing I just really like about this is the slow buildup uh, that like when we, when we, you know, flash, I guess, forward from the crash, but backwards from the current time where the slow itch he has on his hand, like slowly ramps up to turning into the eyes. And I, I love the writing of the first time he sees, he sees the eyes. There were eyes peering up at me through splits in the flesh of my fingers. And even as I watched, the flesh was dilating, retreating, as they pushed their mindless way up to the surface. But that was not what made me scream. I had looked into my own face and seen a monster. And that's really the the central hook of this thing, is not just that he has creepy glowing eyes in his hand, but that they are so alien to us that they look at us and everything about our existence and and see it as just 
horrifying, terrifying, and absolutely monstrous. It's it's a really fun conceit, I think. I love it. This felt to me like the root of the whole idea for the story. Like, okay, Lovecraft stories, they always involve some eldritch monstrosities of, of the elder gods that are just so mm-hmm. horribly ugly and loathsome and bad that merely looking upon them drives you mad. And then King says, well, what if like, what if there were Lovecraft creatures that saw us as being loathsome and yeah. th- th- there's, there's a specific line in there. If, I don't remember exactly what it was, but uh, oh yeah, it, it was um, referring to what it saw in our world as impossible right angles. <laughs> um, and that's like a, a staple of Lovecraft is, is like wandering around some elder God city and seeing these like I- Im- impossible angles where it's like, that this uh you know grotesque geometry or, or whatever and it's like uh-huh. you know to, to refer to it as an I- impossible right angles is like okay so they come from a weird fucked up elder gods world and they're looking at our world and, and it's like it's just it's it's disgusting and horrifying to them in, in the same way that that theirs would be disgusting to ours i, I thought that was I thought that's what he's going for and, and i i love it no i think you're absolutely right there i, I love that so much and I, and I do think this draws an interesting line back to graveyard shift as well you know where we have these rats looking upon us with these judging eyes of a jury, um, these, these monstrous things that, that look at our world and they're like, fuck, fuck no. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, no, that's great. That's great. I did, that didn't occur to me at all, but I love that. It's, this is such a weird concept to me. And that's part of the reason I love it because again, like you're totally right. Graveyard shift King working graveyard shift uh, in a gross plant. And it's disgusting and there are rats all around. And he's like, oh, gross. What if they were giant and scary? Uh, the mangler, king, working in a laundry uh, place. There's this giant scary machine that's like super hot and super powerful. And what what, what if that was evil? And then this one is like, what if there were creepy alien eyes in a guy's hand? And you're just like, what? <laughs> we're what where'd you get that one from you uh-huh. know like i think it, it's part of what makes it so fun is it's just like i don't know it's just this really fun idea of yeah we'll just like they they infect him and then he grows eyes in his hands yeah and then then they see things and take over yeah it's great it's it's a mixture of kind of body snatcher horror and i guess it's mostly body, body snatcher horror actually mm-hmm. when you think about it but yeah, yeah. i i don't know i i love i love the story actually uh, and I, I love this as well. And little by little, I felt them, them, an anonymous intelligence. I never really wondered what they looked like or where they had come from. It was moot. I was their doorway and their window on the world. I got enough feedback from them to feel their revulsion and horror, to know that our world was very different from theirs, enough feedback to feel their blind hate. But still they watched. Their flesh was embedded in my own. I began to realize they were using me, actually manipulating me. I, I, we've already talked about this a lot, but I really love this, like this, this blind hatred, this look upon our world and just it's horrifying and disgusting to them and they hate it. And yet like, isn't this kind of a microcosm of what King was talking about in the intro a little bit here? Yeah. Like this idea that like, we're fascinated by this, this, th- you know, we, we have to look at the car crash. We have to see what happens when the person's horribly mutilated. We need to see and look at it. Even if it disgusts us, we still find a reason to to check it out. Um, and that's kind of what these unknowable alien beings are doing. Yeah. I like that, man. Yeah. That that's, that's, that's great. I, I was thinking about the story we're going to talk about in a second with the, the, the mangler where mm-hmm. he never quite, shows us what the mangled bodies look like but yeah he kind of just gives enough description around the edges that we kind of infer but yeah um and and that's us kind of wanting to see right uh no that that's that's very that's very fun yeah i mean i guess Mm -hmm. you're sort of paralleling the the creatures to to the reader here and i I like that i am i am yeah i mean because that's like these are the eyes with which we're looking at the story through right yeah and and what are the eyes looking at the first time they see in the story a book Look uh-huh. at my book uh, love it it's great it's genius so finally arthur starts removing the bandages realizing that the only way he will make richard believe him is to show him the eyes and they immediately begin to take over seeing nothing but revulsion when looking at richard and then um matt they like call down a lightning bolt and like 
blow him up uh-huh. with magic lightning. Yep. I, again, I like that this is not like King doesn't even bother to try to explain what that means. It's just like, yeah, you know, the they they're it's Thor. It's Thor yeah, in, they can, in my hands. They can do that. Sure, why not? Yeah. 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 It's it's the, the the point is that they're just like you don't know what they can and can't do, and that makes it sure. scarier. Right. No, I agree. I totally agree. Um, but regardless, Arthur decides that this moment means he has to finally act and he douses both his hands in kerosene and lights them on fire. <laughs> and uh, it works. It works. He kills the eye aliens. Yeah, it's pretty badass. It's it's kind of a classic horror sci fi story ending where like we, we we do actually win, but it's like at a horrible, horrible cost um, yeah. to, to our heroic protagonist <laughs> um but of course we have our, our classic short story hook or or, or or not hook but end where we move to seven years later as as mankind is as we see continuing to push into deep space and uh, arthur is attempting to to tell them not to and uh but but that all that is ending because he's going to kill himself because there's a perfect circle of 12 golden eyes on my chest um, which is like, we haven't talked about it a lot, but this is one of those fun things that, that short stories can do, right? Like, like again, if this was the end of a novel and it just ended this way, you'd be like, what? That, that sucks. But like uh-huh. to have this kind of last minute twist ending at the end of a short story, you just get a kind of get a chuckle out of it because you haven't invested that much time in the story and this character. And you're like, oh, that's fun. He thought he got rid of him, but he didn't. Yeah, that's great. Yep, and and of course, you know, implication that humanity will run across this horrible, unknowable thing out there in the darkness yep. again. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just just to briefly talk about this character, like he's maybe like the most straightforward kind of heroic character I can ever recall in a King story. Like, <laughs> sure. like the, the the he's he's this he's this astronaut who suffers a horrible crash, but he just has a stiff upper lip about it. And then he develops these horrible symptoms and he really does his best to try to deal with it and burns his hands and still lives on and tries to tell the government not to explore space. And then finally he sacrifices himself mm-hmm. and he's, he's kind of consistently uncomplaining throughout this whole nightmare. Sure. Um, so yeah, uh, three cheers for Arthur, the the best character <laughs> ever. <laughs> At least in these five stories, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, as we finish up the story, Matt, is there like a, is there like a metaphor here, or like a, a deeper meaning, or like a deeper symbol behind? Because that's the one thing you know. We I think we've talked kind of about um, some some deeper meaning we can try to pull out of this thing. But one of the things that struck me about the story so much was like I, I look at Graveyard Shift and I'm like, oh, this is like a critique of industrialization and what it does to people and and the, the monsters it can create. Um, and then you, you, you look at, um, you know, uh, night surf and you can say like uh, 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 treaties on, on nihilism. And, and this one, I'm just like, is this just like, I don't know, man, eyes. <laughs> what yeah. do you think? Is there anything else here? No, there's no metaphor. <laughs> I mean, Come I don't on. know. Like, like, don't, you know, the, the dangers of exploring, uh, too deep, d- too deeply into the unknown, um sure sure you know the dangers of of this kind of mechanical rationality that king warns about in in the stand and elsewhere i yeah. i don't know i don't know yeah I mean, I mean that's as good as anything i don't i don't have anything to add to that outside of what i've already talked about myself like it's um, not even crazy right because it's, it's some somebody somewhere recently said like we don't we don't know that we won't discover another neutron at any moment and and the the meaning of that discovering a neutron it's like there was a time like roughly 100 years ago that they didn't they didn't know what neutrons were at all Mm -hmm. and then and then they discovered neutrons and they were like oh cool now we understand like a lot more about how atoms are put together and then pretty quickly after that they realized that certain atoms could undergo a fission chain reaction and then they were like shit we accidentally invented a weapon that could destroy the world (laughs) and and you can never put that genie back in the bottle so it's like you discover a neutron and suddenly you've changed the balance of power and you now have to worry about 
global annihilation for the rest of time. And we don't know that there aren't other other neutrons, uh, you know, metaphorically speaking. There are other things that that we actually would be much better off if we didn't discover. Um, maybe maybe there are. Maybe there are sure. weird aliens that we don't want to run across in deep space. Totally possible. This is not not a not science fiction, you know. Yeah, no, I, I like this. I like this idea of just like you know our 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 kind of lust to explore, uh, you know, just the the old Jurassic Park scientists who are so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should type of thing. Yeah, exactly. And uh, speaking of which, how's AI going? Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be fine it'll be fine let's nothing let's bad's all, gonna ever let's happen all forget our troubles with a nice glass of lemonade all right let's talk about the mangler let's forget our troubles by talking about demon laundry machines demon laundry machines so this one was originally published in the december 1972 edition of cavalier magazine again and honestly matt this is this was always actually in previous reads one of my least favorite at least of these five we're talking about today it's not that it's bad it's not bad i think i think it's 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 fine um and obviously we talked about this already but king worked in a laundry just like this one when he was still struggling to provide for his family and and make it as a, a writer and i think he was teaching as well i think this was probably like a summer job he was doing and and it's definitely one of those things where he was like looking at this machine and going like man these things sure are dangerous what if it wanted to kill boom story? Yeah. Um, I do think the thing that kind of unlocked the story for me on this reread was if you just actually treat it as a comedy, like it's just supposed to be horror comedy. It actually, I think starts to work considerably better on you. Yes. I'm so glad you said that. Um, <laughs> it immediately transformed the story in my mind into something that worked uh, a lot a lot better because there's so much in it where it's just so corny um mm -hmm. and 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 it's uh, but then you realize like oh it's like supposed to be corny or or at least yeah. if you read it that way yeah it's it's better yeah yeah i mean Is the it, story ends with a, a a giant like 30 foot long <laughs> demon laundry folding machine like stomping down main street <laughs> Yeah, right. This would be one that I'd be okay with us going through quicker, by the way, because it is it is just kind of a silly sure. lark. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's fine. Um, so yeah, we the, the story kind of starts with the, the a person getting trapped and crushed in what the people at the laundry have affectionately titled the mangler. Um, <laughs> it's never done anything like this in the past, but they've already named it the mangler, which is just fucking hilarious, uh -huh. actually. No, it's it's great. It's so good. It's so funny, actually. Um, you know, I, I have. If you, if you look at like like sometimes I think King's comedy, like I don't I don't. There's a thing about King when he writes comedy that it's like it's not that it's deceptive, but it's not like straightforward. And because there's so much gnarly stuff happening around it, you might lose the tone as you're reading it. Like I think, um, um, uh, Needful Things is a great example of this. That book's uh -huh. a comedy. Like that is a comedy book. It like a hundred, like that's, it's a hilarious story, but also it's like super fucked up actually. And so like, if you're not it, vibing with the comedic parts of it, the comedy just will stop working on you. And I think a lot of the Mangler is this way as well. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, it, it goes exactly. It goes so dark that you're like, Jesus. And then like yeah. you, you forget to laugh. Um, uh -huh. I think King does have a really, really dark sense of humor. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I admit that I, I I couldn't visualize what an industrial speed ironer was supposed to look like, so I just kind of made up a vision in my head. But uh, who cares? It's fine. What does the mangler look like? So you're gonna find when you look that up that there's a 1995 some kind of visual adaptation. Is it? A oh TV? yeah, no. There's uh, there's been like several mangler sequels actually. Um, fascinating so this is actually this, uh, this I, I meant to say this at the beginning of the show so i'll, I'll put it re right here in the middle where uh no one will remember it but me um a, a huge amount of the books or the stories in this book have been adapted like uh -huh. like a huge amount actually like of the ones we're talking about today just today graveyard shift been made into a movie um the night surf no um I think there was a, a dollar baby for I am the doorway, but um, Mangler made into a movie. 
the boogeyman a movie is coming out um and and this is a trend that's going to continue through all of this map like a, a shockingly large number of the stories in this thing have been made into into feature length stuff um so what I'm saying is other levels of the tower is going to have a lot, a lot of content for the next year because we have a lot of the stuff to watch. Fascinating. Okay, great. Can't wait to watch the mangler. It's, it's great, man. It's really great. Oh my God. Okay. So the, 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 the thing that I, I like about, we already kind of talked about this a little, so I'll go through this fast, but I really love the way in which King holds back on what this woman uh, that was crushed by the mangler looks like I, I like we have we have our, our main character Hunton, who is a 14 year old veteran cop who has been to countless incidents who's seen it all uh, he takes one look at what the mangler did to this woman and he pukes and then the book cuts away from the scene right we don't actually get to see any of it and it's not till later where he's recounting the day to his friend that he even like hints towards us what what it what it possibly kind of looks like it, it 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 just does it through dialogue he doesn't describe anything to us through narration it's just it tried to fold everything but a person isn't a sheet mark what i saw what was left of her they took her out in a basket and i think that's just it's like he knows right like he knows that we're immediately interested to see what this looks like. Like he, he primes us for it and then he withholds it from us for a long time. And then he gives us just enough of a taste of it to where we're hooked. It's just really, really effective. It is really effective. But now that you've made me aware that it's supposed to be funny, it's really funny actually. <laughs> <laughs> a person isn't a sheet mark. A person isn't a sheet mark. When I saw <laughs> what was left of her, took her out in a basket you're so um, right man you're so right i mean i mean but like both at the same time though like like it is effective in making you like want to see i want to see how, like what does that mean mm-hmm. um i mean presumably it just means she's like a pile of giblets in a basket yeah. which if you just said that that's a lot less like you know interesting so i agree yeah um all right so the mangler uh, mangles obviously and <laughs> we see here that like it, it passes all inspections here um and and they're they're confused because like, there's supposed to be a safety bar on this thing and any human contact trips the safety bar the machine immediately shuts down and everything's fine which introduces the idea that maybe it's haunted <laughs> man you know now that you brought out this idea of like king critiquing like industrial practices uh-huh i really love that you you pointed that out because like this is another one where it's like hey maybe like pass a certain number of maimings on machines that are currently passing inspection you just say like maybe the inspection's not catching something <laughs> yeah and maybe you, the problem is osha not the mangler <laughs> yeah it, well what you're saying is that osha is a demonic presence um I mean, that's what you're saying yeah, yeah. no um I, I think i think it is critiquing like how, how we ride this line of safety with this stuff that this is dangerous machinery that can absolutely hurt and maim and kill people and does so constantly and and we we develop rules around how to keep people safe but like the rules only go so far right that that, that yeah. yeah yeah the the idea that someone gets sucked into this thing the safety bar does not work. They inspect the thing and go, well, there's nothing that shouldn't have happened. And you're like, okay, but it did though. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, you're right. Keep using the machine. It's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah. I mean, shouldn't we find out how it happened first before uh we put the thing back into operation? No, we're good. We're good. it It was, it was user error. Okay. But like how though? like yeah. specifically <laughs> yeah yeah like maybe we need to examine the entire concept of the safety bar if it's not working yeah yeah and so so i mean the, the only logical explanation of course is demon possession yeah which is like this is this is where like the comedy of it really opens up to me right because like Hunton is talking to his friend jackson who suggests that hey maybe it's not haunted it's possessed and that perhaps the the woman that they learned recently that cut herself and spilled her blood on the machine right when this also st- all this started maybe she was a virgin and it's all just very 
silly because like there's there's even a scene where Hunton is like, yeah, so I'm just going to like walk up to this random woman and go, excuse me, are you a virgin? That's ridiculous. And then like three pages later, he just walks up to a random woman and goes, um, we have one more question for you. Are you are you a virgin? Yeah. Um, I mean, but the, the part of the comedy I think of this to me is, you know, and we talked about this a lot in Salem's Lot. We talked about how the idea of vampires being real, the idea of vampires existing was this thing that like half that novel took to really get to. It took our characters a very long time to get to a place of acceptance of that there's otherworldly things happening and, and there's no logical, rational explanation for them. And in this short story, it just feels like, the cop's talking to his friend and he goes, I don't know, man, maybe it's like a demon or something. And they're like, no, it can't be a demon. And then one more person gets hurt and they're like, nope, it's, it's definitely, it's a hundred percent a demon. Let's exercise that thing. It just happens very quickly. Yeah. Um, and, and I think part of that is because it's a short story, but I also do think part of that is the, the kind of whimsical tone to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely, right. In a short story, you can't afford to do the Salem's Lot kind of slow play, but also it's like the 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 silliness with which the demonic stuff is treated where it's like I forget the exact like, like you know, uh uh or or, or use, using a computer algorithm to like <laughs> to like refactor the the demonic sigil like 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 appearances of different demonic qualities it's so so goofy like self-consciously goofy um yeah i i I love that i love it all yeah and i I agree with you it's yeah. yeah i mean and the idea of like could any of these things be interpreted loosely and then he's like, yeah, usually pretty loosely. And he's like, substitute jello for horse's hoof. Right. Very popular in bag lunches. I noticed a little container sitting under the ironer's sheet platform. Yeah. Because <laughs> gelatin is made from horse's hoof. And it's just like, it's just having a good time, man. It really is. Yeah. And then the idea, again, culminating the idea that the 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 belladonna comes from stomach <laughs> pills and, and that like easy, this is easy gel yeah. stomach tablets the, this is the way the demonology of the world actually works is that you can accidentally summon a demon by using jello and eat in easy tabs for your for your tummy um and, and, the, and the drop of blood of a virgin it's yeah. uh it's, it's ridiculous well and again i think the characters really support this comedy read of this whole thing because like He's talking with Jackson and he's like, all right, I think I'm, I'm pretty sure the computer has run the data for me and I'm pretty sure it's this kind of uh, ex- demon, which is easily exercised. No big deal. But the only way we'd have a problem at all is if there was some hand of glory involved and we didn't know. And Hunton's like, well, like, are you sure? And he's like, yeah, I mean, pretty sure. He's like, well, what would happen if we're wrong? Oh, you know, just a horrible, dangerous demon would get out. <laughs> There'd be no stopping it. But yeah, we're probably good. Let's just let's just go. Let's yeah. just, we're it's gonna be fine. Don't worry about it. And it's yeah. just I don't know. It's just goofy. It's just cheesy. It's, I I love it. It's very cheesy. Um, it's uh like like you can imagine the adaptation being cheesy. In uh, not that I've seen the adaptation, but you can mm-hmm. imagine it being cheesy in the same way as the you know Christine where. Christine is, is is a cheesy movie that also has heart to it. And you can imagine it being cheesy in a lot of the same ways where it's like, look, it's an evil car that morphs and wants to kill people. Like it's a silly idea and you, and you can play it for silliness, but you can also make it serious. You got an evil car versus an evil ironing industrial machine, <laughs> similar vibes. Uh-huh. Um, I, uh, I, I love that. I just, it's so good. It's so good. It's so good. So they they do the exorcism and obviously it doesn't work because because of the hand of glory, which, by the way, the way King reveals that fact to us, I think, is so absolutely delightful. It, it's it's really vintage King here. We're like, like, I, I'm going to read a little bit of it here. Adele Frawley was dead, sewed together by a patient undertaker. She laid in her coffin, yet something of her spirit perhaps remained in the machine. And if it did, it cried out. She would have known, could have warned them. She could have, She had been prone to indigestion, and for this common ailment, she had taken a common stomach tablet called Easy Gel, purchased over the counter of any drugstore for 79 cents. The side panel holds a printed warning. People with glaucoma must not take Easy Gel because the active ingredient causes an aggravation of that condition. 
Unfortunately, Adele Frawley did not have that condition. She might have remembered the day, shortly before Sherry Owlette cut her hand, that she had dropped a full box of easy gel tablets into the mangler by accident. But she was dead, unaware that the active ingredient which soothed her heartburn was a chemical derivative of belladonna, known quaintly in some European countries as the Hand of Glory. (laughs) It's just like the way that information is revealed is so, like, deliciously excited about like ah we know something that the characters don't know Uh and then i think the mangler like (laughs) chuckles to itself afterwards (laughs) yeah no you're right i I totally agree yeah i I love that kind of inserted narration it's almost like Mm -hmm. smug dramatic irony Mm -hmm. so they begin the exorcism but as we know they're dealing with a much rougher and more powerful demon than they thought And it begins to break out. And again, I can't help but laugh of the absurdity of all this. It's like an ironing machine, but it's like breaking out of its stilts. And like the mouth is the the canvas roller of the the thing, like the tread as a tongue. And it's just, I just, I just imagine it so goofy and wonderful. Me too. Now that you've pointed this out, what they needed is they needed Father Callahan's pneumatic... Um, Bible gun <laughs> that would have solved this problem because I mean honestly it's pretty straightforward lack of Bibles mm-hmm. they only have the one and lack of complete lack of holy water so but the pneumatic Bible gun exactly what would be called for in this situation I hope our listeners remember uh, that conversation because that's really one of the greatest uh, Matt Freeman moments of the podcast is the pneumatic Bible gun. So yeah, and here it's coming up totally organically and <laughs> like actually, you know, I feel bad for these guys. They really yeah. could have used. They didn't know they should go to Matt's pneumatic Bible guns dot com and uh, yeah. and purchase their very own. Let me see if that URL is available. It's definitely available. <laughs> I mean, we might as well buy it, right? It is available. Yeah, might as well. What are we going to sell um, at MatthewMaticBibleGuns.com? I'd, I'd like to try to sell pneumatic Bible guns because you never know. How How are you going to do that, Matt? Um, the problem is we've now said this publicly on a podcast, so we have exactly two days to purchase <laughs> Matt's pneumatic Bible gun.com or someone's going to buy it. Somebody's going to buy it and start selling pneumatic Bible guns, <laughs> which, you know, maybe actually I'm just totally fine with that. Yeah, I, I would, I would buy one, you know? Yeah. We have good. to move on. <laughs> good. We good. Have to yep. move on. Okay. Yeah, so the mangler gets out and rampages down the street, and that's the way our story ends wonderfully with just a giant fucking laundry folding machine stomping its way down the street, (laughs) heading heading right toward Hunton and uh, to to come eat him. It's oh man, yeah. the The last bit is the best because it's like wait, 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 wait. the The ironing machine is walking down the street now. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, when they first mentioned the idea that if you don't do the exorcism right, the demon will get out, I didn't think they literally meant that the machine was going to get up and (laughs) march out of the door of the laundry place. Yeah. I thought it meant, like, the demon would escape the machine and just be a free demon running around on Earth. Right. But no, it's the machine (laughs) itself. That's so good. That's that's so king, right? Like... (laughs) to go there you know yeah yeah i love this story i really do it's it's not like it's not great I, I, i'd never listed as one of my favorites of this thing but it's it's very fun i agree and uh and we move from that into i think almost the exact opposite of that uh in in our final story of the week the boogeyman which is a very serious probably i mean definitely the scariest one we we read this week um, and kind of my favorite as well. I think this is my favorite of this this bunch for sure. Um, it's not super complex. It's not otherworldly. It's not. It's just like simple, effective, old school horror writing. I think is the Boogeyman. Yeah. Well, and it does it does all of the things right that King is good at. That maybe yeah. we we complain about with the other stories where it's got a very solid narrative through line, yeah. and it's got a very solid character. Um, mm-hmm solidly terrible solidly terrible um piece of shit but like which isn't which is interesting i guess we'll have plenty of opportunity to talk about that but like 
so uh-huh. interesting to have made him a giant asshole. Yep. Um, like that's a very specific choice to make in this kind of story. It certainly is. It certainly is. So let's get into it. Uh, the boogeyman uh, begins with Lester Billings on the couch of Dr. Harper. He starts the story by doing what all these other stories do is once again, informing the doctor that he's killed all of his kids. Um, so he immediately <laughs> like, Oh, Oh, really? Uh, we learn what he actually means is that the boogeyman has killed his kids, but he feels responsible for that. And and like you said, I want to get this out of the way at the beginning. Lester Billings is a complete piece of shit. Uh, he sucks in uh, just about any way a person and every way a person can suck. Um, and, and I think you're absolutely right that this is a this is a choice and it's a choice we have to we have to examine here um, because. This is this is a story. The Boogeyman is basically a story about the fear of losing your children, right? Like I think this is the one that, to me, is most clearly linked to what King talked about in the forward of the story, where this is one of the central fears of all parents, especially parents of young young children, is is your children dying? Um, like the, the fear of of sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS, um, or I think I think a uh, what did they call it in in this story with like the old name for it? I think it was just crib cradle death, death or, or crib death. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah. Uh, th- this is a very real fear uh, that you have as a, as a new parent. I can say this definitively. Uh, it doesn't help that like every bit of literature the hospital gives you like terrifies you of SIDS and, and how little we know about it actually. Like everyone's like, yeah, um, sleeping on its back reduces SIDS. Yeah. And you'd be like, well, how? And their response is, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we so, don't actually know. We just know that statistically kids that sleep on their back are less likely to, to yeah. die suddenly. You're just like, awesome. Yeah. Great. By the way, sleeping on their back is going to make their head grow weird. Yeah. Um, but you're going to do it anyway because uh-huh. you're. what are you going to do? Let them sleep on their stomach? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You fucking crazy person. Yeah. And yeah. so we're taking this very rear – real fear that I think all parents experience at some point uh, in, in their young children's life. And then you're adding that element of spooky horror to it. Like you're, you're, you're taking the fear, you're taking the thing that you're afraid of happening and you're externalizing it into the boogeyman and your readers know that the boogeyman isn't real, but they know that SIDS is. And suddenly you're terrified because it's connecting this external force to a real thing. Um, and I, I promise I'll, I'll get to <laughs> I'll get to why this matters to why Lester is a piece of shit in a moment. But I just wanted to, part, to allow you to speak for a second here. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so I agree with everything you just said about SIDS. Um, I'll just say like we we had those like motion monitors, which were a huge like psychological help, um, uh-huh. no, even if sure. it's uh, in some sense like self soothing. You know. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, I had this suspicion for this whole story that like maybe this guy is just crazy mm-hmm. and maybe it really was just SIDS and other accidents totally out of his control, basically extreme bad luck, um, which I think is interesting because even if there's like no textual support for the idea that this character is just strictly crazy and this is all just bad luck, like the idea that it's just bad luck is also a very horrifying thought because like there's mm-hmm. no rule of the universe that says you can't be uh this horribly unlucky um yeah y- you can't be so unlucky that it just breaks your brain and makes and, and drives you mad um so I, I i don't know i'm 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 somewhat interested in pursuing that sort of parallel interpretation of the story um even though the story is pretty straightforwardly like yep it's a it's a goopy it's a goopy closet man um but that that was one thing that was like really on my mind while reading it was the idea that like well maybe it maybe there is no boogeyman. Yeah, no, I I I really like that read a lot. I don't know, like with The Shining, I don't know if there's like textual textual support for it in the mm-hmm. story itself. But I, I think it's a it's certainly a, a fun read to have of it. Yeah. Um. So anyway, why is Lester a piece of shit? Um. And I think the answer is here is he's not actually okay i don't want to say like he he is he is he is a piece of shit but i think he's he's espousing a lot of like the the good old boy traditional family values you know uh kind of kind of way of thinking um at the time right um and and i think 
I th- like like this idea is like, oh, you shouldn't coddle your kids or, you know, obviously like the worst possible thing could be if my son was 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 gay or, or women are manipulators and they need to know their place. You know, these are all like very traditional, traditional, quote unquote, values uh, that a lot of a lot of people, especially a lot of men were espousing um, at the time and, and still today, frankly. Um, and so I think what the book is doing is saying that like this kind of thinking, this kind of behavior, this kind of bullshit is literally killing our children. Um, Mm -hmm. Like, I think this is King commenting on this entire way of, of parenting or raising your children. Um, Like, like there's so many moments in this thing where like, like it's like, um, you know, you shouldn't, uh, he he's he's screaming out but you can't coddle these children you know he's he's terrified but you can't you can't coddle him you know yeah. um and i think king is definitely making commentary on this kind of thing by having this guy just over and over and over again espouse some of the worst possible shit a human being can say yeah yeah he he's like the perfect product of his environment and his yeah. time mm-hmm. um and and he, like everything that's bad about him is just a reflection of his environment. So yep. he he's not like specifically particularly flawed as a human being. It's almost it, it, I agree with you totally that it's it's he's more a reflection of a certain ethos than he is like a a, a person. Yeah, yeah. The, he King did not build him this way to describe a specific individual that behaves this way. He is he is making a commentary on a larger issue and a larger, you know, social commentary on the way people think and the way people are raised to think. And uh, yeah, love it. Love it. Yeah. Um, so we get to this part here. Anyway, he died the summer after Cheryl was born. I put him to bed that night and he started crying right off. I heard what he said at the time. He pointed right at the closet when he said it. Boogeyman, the kid says. Boogeyman, daddy. Um, so I just want to say here, this story fucked me up big time. I had never read the story since I had children and the moments, the moments of seeing the, the the corpses of his children really messed me up. But also the moments of like the kid crying out in fear really fucked me up. Like literally yesterday, <laughs> we put my son to bed. Everything was fine. And then like 15 minutes in, he just like stood up in his crib and just started screaming his lungs off. Like, <sighs> in, like the, you know, you learn to tell that your kids have different cries, right? And there's just, right. the, I don't like this cry. This was like a, like a scre- like screaming mama and dada um, while crying. Like he was terrified. And of course this fucking story was in my mind <laughs> as this was happening. And so it's like my wife and I are looking at each other and we're like, um, do we give him some time to calm down or we go in there? And I'm just like, we're, we're going to, we're just going to go in there right now. <laughs> Uh, and he's he's totally fine i I don't know what happened like i don't know like he he, maybe he had a bad dream or something i don't know you know the brain is complicated i don't know what happened that triggered this particular thing but man it this this story was enormously triggering for me yeah yeah he probably just had a bad dream there scott don't worry about it (laughs) i mean he did point at the closet and say boogeyman dada Uh and i the, the, the thing, man, <laughs> Matt, the thing about this story actually is, is you're torn between the, the truth that Lester is a piece of shit that is like constantly like, oh, we don't want to coddle our children. And oh, my son died in crib death, but we're just going to put our daughter right back in that same crib because you just got to, you just got, you, you can't coddle them or they turn into sissies. You're torn between that and just going, you suck. And also, the very real knowledge that if your child came up to you today right now and said, there's a boogeyman in the closet, you would probably be like, okay, let me, I'll, I'll go in and check. No, no boogeyman here. Okay. Go to bed. You know, like this is yeah. what anyone would do because yeah. there's no such thing as a boogeyman. And so like, you're, you're, you're definitely in this place where like, Lester, you suck. You're the worst fucking parent. I hate you. And also, yeah, I probably wouldn't like take my kid into my bedroom because they're scared of the boogeyman. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also like, you know, we don't, we don't say like, no, no, don't come for the child. Now get back in the kitchen woman. But, mm-hmm. but what we do, <laughs> but like we do say like what you just said, like, let's give him a minute to try to calm down. Right. Yeah. 
Like, yeah. like we, we do that kind of thing. We do that kind mm-hmm. of thing. And, and I, 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 I'm sure I did worse because I had, you know, each of my kids had kind of different levels of like, yeah, inconsolable sleepiness problems. And sometimes it was like really hard, but sometimes the answer was just like, they will calm themselves down and it's, right. it's, it's like worse if I go in there yeah, because then they actually wake up more, et cetera, et cetera. So like you, you it sucks actually, because you have like this programming to be miserable when the baby is crying. It's like yeah. hardwired. Um, and actually we're probably supposed to just like live with the baby tied to our body as we do everything, <laughs> just like the way I think people used to do it. Um, mm. but, uh, uh, we still kind of struggle with this kind of, anyway, yeah, like, like it's a very, yeah. it's very relevant to our, our life. And that's why I think it affected you and me a lot. No, for sure. I mean, like I, I watched so many videos and took so many courses about sleep training because it was really important for us to ensure our kid was successful with this. And fortunately our son is great. He does a great job with sleeping 99% of the time. Um, and a lot of that was teaching them to self soothe, right? Like, like the, th- the way it was described to me is that kids literally need to learn how to sleep. Like they don't, they don't know how to do it. That like we wake up constantly and at night all the time in between REM cycles, we wake up a little bit between them, but our bodies are trained and our brains are trained to just go back to sleep. Whereas a kid will just be like, what the fuck? <laughs> what yeah. was that? I'm awake all of a sudden. What was that thing? And just freak out. And yeah. like, you gotta, you gotta train them to learn how to just, it's time to just go back to sleep now. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, there, that, that all that, all that crap is mixed up in this whole thing. And it just, it, it makes it scarier. It makes it personal. It makes it terrifying. Yep. Yep. And, and again, like we talked before about how King is, is, is making you look at the fact that like, yeah, you can feel flashes of like real anger towards mm-hmm. your kid. And then you can like justify that anger to kind of be harsh toward them. And then you kind of yeah. retroactively justify that harshness as part of the grand pattern of like, well, you got to raise these kids right. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's all this just giant tangle that, it, it's really hard to deal with. Yeah. And, and so with the second kid, he's going through the same thing, right? We have this, I wanted to take her into our room for the night. Did you? No. Billings regarded his hands and his face twitched. How could I go to Rita and admit I was wrong? I had to be strong. She was always such a jellyfish. Look how easy she went to bed with me when we weren't married. <laughs> what a <laughs> fucking dick. <laughs> <laughs> No, this is, it is great, it's especially the uh, psychiatrist's response to this. Yeah, where he's like, "Or how easy you went to bed with her." And he's like, are "What?" You? Yeah, um, he's like, "Are you messing with me?" <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, no, <laughs> what the hell are you talking stating about? Stating a fact. Yeah, right. stating a fact. You piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. Um. So so yeah, I I I I pulled this out. I don't think I'm going to read it because I don't like it. But I I just want to reiterate like the descriptions of the dead children to me were especially difficult to read. I think King does a very good job of um, making those very emotional. And again, this is the first, like I always thought the story was like spooky. Um, This is the first time reading it as a parent and it, uh, it definitely hits home. Um, Just like it's, it's just very easy to put your kid on the kids that's being described here. In yeah. these, these corpse descriptions yeah i mean i i think i just um at this point have like way more like I, I just care about children a lot more than i did before i had children just generally mm-hmm. speaking i mean yeah what you just said is accurate it, you can put your own kid's face on it but also you can i i don't know like when, even when I, when I just hear news stories about bad things happening to children yeah it, I, I, it's like horrible it's like the worst yeah, thing ever the, no. and yeah and that's a good point. I, I want to be clear that I'm not saying like this, this will only affect you emotionally if you are a parent, right? You, you have to, being a parent unlocks, like, I, I don't think that's, it, it certainly did that for me. I'm not saying like the yeah. only way you could have empathy for these children is by being a parent yourself, but uh, it, it's in me, it certainly unlocked this ability to, to make this much more personal and yeah. hit home much closer. Yeah, I think I mean I think for me it did some brain rewiring and made me care about stuff that I wouldn't have cared about yeah. before. So that's why we that's yeah. why we mention it that way. Um so so we learned that despite getting an IUD, 
uh, Lester's wife gets pregnant again and they have their third kid, Andy, the one Lester actually likes and he feels the most close to. So all the rules he stringently followed with everything else, uh, he breaks with this kid because it turns out it had nothing to do with parent raising and just that he really didn't like those kids at all very much, <laughs> actually, because he's yeah. an asshole. Those those were just kind of crappy kids. Yeah, those were the test kids. Yeah, right. And so we learn they have a wonderful year together, but then the boogeyman comes back. Well, I mean, uh, this is interesting because it's not like everything's super well and then suddenly boogeyman. It, it seems, and I think this might go to support your theory here that this is all made up. It seems that the boogeyman comes back because Lester kind of decides the boogeyman came back, right? Like, like listen to this this bit right here. Last year wasn't so good. Something about the house changed. I started keeping my boots in the hall because I didn't like to open the closet door anymore. I kept thinking, well, what if it's in there? I'll crouch down and ready to spring the second I open the door. And I started thinking I could hear squishy noises as if something black and green and wet was moving around in there just a little. So again, it's not like, you know, everything was going great. And then one day my son mentioned the boogeyman again. It's, it's one day everything was going great. And then I decided, eh, Something feels yeah. off. Something feels wrong. I, I really don't think I'm crazy for this reading. I, I think that, that what we're looking at here in, in this character is a, is a guy who just doesn't know how to be happy. Mm -hmm. And when like, you know, what can be the best thing in the world for a person, which is to have a kid happens to him, he, he, he has to find ways to, to make it a problem. Sure. And and then he makes choices that then lead to his kids dying. Again, take it as a metaphor, take it literally. Either way, he refused to let his wife take care of the baby the way she thought she should, and the first two kids died. And then he and then he has a kid that's like actually making him really happy on a on a personal one on one level. Mm -hmm. And and he just can't like <sighs> I, I don't know. I, I like strongly feel that this is true, even though I don't know if I can point to a specific like passage that proves it. But I think this is the kind of character this is, where it's like a, a guy who was raised almost to feel like being happy is, is somehow sinful and and like a, a sign of weakness. And the fact that this kid is making him happy actually makes him nervous and, and twitchy, and l leads to the situation where his kid dies. No, I mean, I really like this re read and I almost think like we can live in a world where you're both 100% right and also there is a literal boogeyman at the mm -hmm. same time. Yeah. Like I, I love the idea that like maybe he summoned it, right? Like if mm -hmm. this thing is real, maybe it's it's him summoning it. It's him creating it via the choices he's making or the things that he's thinking about or the unhappiness that he's breeding in the household is bringing this entity to him because why else is the boogeyman messing with him like, right like, why 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 these guys specifically yeah yeah that that was one thing i kept thinking about why him specifically and, and i actually totally agree with you that like if we kind of view this as one of those classic stephen king like demon that feeds on fear type situations mm -hmm. which we've seen like three times now um then then it's like well he's just a he's a person who is capable of of this deep fear yeah. and that's what makes him special yeah no i like that a lot I like that a lot. So, so we see here that the boogeyman is like ramping up. It's bothering, you know, the, the attacks are getting more direct doors are flying open. There's mud tracking through the house. Mirrors are breaking. And so Lester gets afraid. And what does he do, Matt? What does he do in his fear? Well, he uses his son, uh, as a, a, a diversion. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I moved him. I knew it would go for him. See, because he was weaker and it did. The very first night, he screamed in the middle of the night, and finally when I got up the cojones to go in, he was standing up in bed and screaming, The boogeyman, daddy, boogeyman, want to go with daddy, go with daddy. Uh, again, this reading that just kind of broke me a little bit, because uh -huh. like, this is the, it's like the exact age my son is right now and the way he talks right now. Um, yeah. Like, like the, 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 the transition of, of parenthood where the kid wakes up in the middle of the night and starts crying to the kid wakes up in the middle of the night and starts crying and part of the crying is screaming dada yeah. uh, is is a very emotional transition that I was not ready for I got very used to being able to like push the crying out of my mind and let him settle on his own but like when they're calling out to you specifically yeah 
like I, I read this passage and I'm like, how do you not grab this child and immediately run out the room with him? You know, how, how do yeah. you walk away from this, this kid but, in this moment? Again, that's, that's like the thing that makes it like, it's a personal failure of his. It's not mm-hmm. just that he's being hunted by this monster. Yeah. It's his own weakness and cowardice and fearfulness and inability to like stand up to the, to the difficulties of, of, of parenting um, and like being brave in the face of the the fear of losing your child it, it's almost like he yeah. wants to get it over with like all right fine you know kill the kid i'm gonna get I, I can't stand the fear that the kid is gonna die so just take the kid and then he'll be dead and then i won't have to be afraid anymore yeah like like i don't I, well, yeah here's here's another read on this let me f- follow me here okay what if this is all about just the difficulty of having children in the first place because think about it think about it uh-huh. what what are the things what are the things that that lester is dealing with that that represent the boogeyman in this moment all these doors keep opening and their <laughs> doors are always open and uh-huh. there's mud everywhere uh-huh. and like glass is breaking and like there's a read of this that's just like well that's like just what it's like having children in your house because like stuff breaks and I like the that. kids track in dirt and sometimes they just open doors and like my son loves to put things in drawers. So we'll just like open up a drawer in my kitchen and the TV remotes in there. And we're like, what's that doing in there? I don't uh-huh. know. He just did it. And so what if that's just having children? And that's, that's, that's one of the difficulties of having children is your house gets really messy and, and things keep moving around and things keep breaking and it's, it's really stressful and scary. And what do you do in this moment, Lester? Well, you get rid of the kid is what you do because that makes it all easier. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that makes a ton of sense, right? Because the kid is going from being a baby into presumably being a a, a you know little toddler who is mm-hmm. going to be walking mm-hmm. around and, and doing a lot of mischief. Yeah. And Lester is kind of an idiot um, and either, you know, unconsciously doesn't, you know, doesn't put two and two together or or. Uh, yeah that's that's great that's really great i, I kind of want to reread the story now with that kind of added into my like folded into my reading of it's all in his head um looking for more ways in which it could be like as the kids stop being little little babies and they become they become toddlers who can kind of talk that it like becomes yeah. scarier in some way it is interesting because one of the details here that we didn't talk about is his son dies they move his daughter into the same crib and then a year later she dies. Uh-huh. Right. And and so one of the things he says later in the story where they have their one good year where they move away from the house because there are too many bad memories and they have their one good year with Andy is, oh, it probably took the boogeyman like a year to find us. And it ha- had to search for us and find out where we were. And eventually it found us. And that's when it started bothering us again. And so the question you're forced to ask in that is like, well, why did it take a year between the death of the other two kids? Is it perhaps because that's how long it took you to get fucking sick of this kid too? Maybe. Yeah. It's interesting because there's kind of two different, <laughs> there's two different uh, uh, metaphorical readings that we're talking about. One, one of them is that yeah. I guess he killed his kids. Actually, kill- yeah, that that is yeah. And, and the other one, them, yeah, which which was not where I was going. I was just going with he's just super unlucky and it broke his mind. Um, mm-hmm. it's entirely I, I worth keeping an eye out for the reading that he just literally killed his kids though. So I think I I think I like yours better. Um, and I think the the idea of you know the boogeyman is represented by the the everyday frustrations he has with his children mm-hmm. still works in the reading that also they have accidents that happen to them still partially caused by his his neglect. Um, I think still works. Yeah, I. So I I just want to ask like do you think that the reason why I keep going for these galaxy brain it's all a metaphor readings is that there was like a rash of highly successful and popular horror movies that had twist endings where the twist was like they were they were dead the whole time or <laughs> it was all actually a hallucination and oh these two characters are the same person the whole time or or whatever 
and and like that's just permanently broken me and primed me to look for these sorts of things in horror stories possible i i think i think generally the reason why you're doing this and the reason why we're doing this is because we're having to talk about these things on a podcast and we're looking <laughs> for deeper meaning in them like honestly like uh-huh. like i don't think i i've read this story a few times now and i don't think i ever have a memory of reading this story where i walked away from it like I bet that's all in his head and there's really no boogeyman. Uh-huh. I, I just kind of took it as face value that there was, there was a boogeyman that existed in the story. Cause the story tells me there's a boogeyman. So I do, I, I think you have a point that there is in like the, the realm of, of horror storytelling. There is this, this, this trend of, you know, fake out types, twist mm-hmm. stuff. Um, that is fun. Like it's fun. Um, but I don't know yeah it's okay it's i mean i um i don't know i don't think i'm i don't think i'm right or wrong i just i want to be interesting so (laughs) not everything is shutter island matt not 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 everything is shutter island but but shutter island was pretty good (laughs) yeah but 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 a lot of things are shutter island though yeah yeah (laughs) true true yeah i don't know um, I, I do think it's a combination of those two things. Like I, I, I do wonder, I know it's impossible to know if you had just been reading the story for fun, whether that would have been on your mind at all. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, the way the story ends certainly seems to be like, yep, it's definitely yeah. a monster. So that's certainly the biggest nail in the coffin of the, n- there is no monster theory in that, uh, he goes back into the room and it turns out the doctor was the boogeyman the whole time. <laughs> Which is actually like kind of goofy and doesn't uh-huh. necessarily fit the tone of the rest of the story. Yeah. He's just wearing a doctor mask the whole time. No, it does feel like the kind of final twist that I would have added if I just didn't know how to like end the story with a bang yeah. when I was younger. And I'm, maybe I would still do because I'm not really that much like better at writing. But I, I for like for what I thought was a really great story that hit really hard, I don't know about that that last that last page <laughs> i think it works almost entirely because it's just a, a pretty short short story i think this like yeah. is, is a dozen pages at most and so it's just a fun little little stinger on the end for you there um that you don't really have to think about too much that you're just like huh, oh steven like you know again th- think of like the target audience for this is just dudes reading a men, men's magazine right and yeah. they which which by the way actually we didn't talk about that isn't that an interesting choice right yeah you're doing this kind of critique of traditional masculinity in parenting inside a men's magazine, I think is pretty fascinating actually. It is. Yeah. It didn't occur to me. That's a great point. All these are male point of view characters. Yeah. Um, That's because men, men don't want to read about women. Come on, Matt. You know that. Obviously. (laughs) I think we are going to see some some women point of view characters later in the the book, but yeah, you're right. Okay. None of these were. And that is uh, the boogeyman, and that I think is going to do it for the week, Matt. We did it. Um, it was longer than we said we were going to do it in, but we did it. Not not too much longer than we said, but yeah, okay, it, it is it is longer. We're going to have okay. to figure out how to treat it next week, where we have the same number of stories, but also discussion questions to read. So. Uh, we're going to figure something out. We're just going to have to yada yada over, um, one listener's favorite story. I'm sure they'll yeah, be thrilled yeah. with that. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's move into our discussion question. Um, and, uh, Matt, why don't you read this one? I think this is a, kind of a, a more broad one, but I think works for our first week in King short stories. Discussion question is what do you like most about the short story format? Do you enjoy them more or less than full length novels? And why? Please, uh, by the way, do not write a full-length novel in your response to this question. Try to be as as short as you possibly can. Yes, please, for our sakes. All right. Well, that is it for us here this week. Next week, more Night Shift. We will read five more stories. Next week, we're going to be reading Gray Matter, Battleground, Trucks, Sometimes They Come Back, and Strawberry Spring. Matt, any uh, any of those titles uh, pique your interest there? Sometimes they come back. Um, sounds alluring. Gray what about matter. Trucks? trucks. I have no idea what that's about. I, I, I about uh, trucks. 
yeah so i'll say i have no idea what any of these are like i don't i didn't <laughs> i i didn't read any of these you know illicitly uh in the past Good. when w- when i wasn't supposed to um yeah or anything like that so totally you've been reading it you've been reading the stephen king behind my back <laughs> not not since not, not since you caught me last time <laughs> um yeah this will be fun total clean slate here Yep, no, I, I'm looking forward to it. There's there's definitely some good ones in this that you're going to have fun with. Um, I don't want to say anything more because I want it to be a total surprise for you, but uh, cool. you're going to have some fun, definitely, definitely. All right, all right. Well, remember, you can reach us via email at kingslingerspod at gmail.com or on Twitter at kingslingerspod, or you can reach us and everybody else over on the subreddit at r slash doofmedia. And if you're not already subscribed to Kingslingers, oh boy, is it the time to do it. We're going to be covering Night Shift for the next month, but after that, we're moving on to The Long Walk. And then after that, Stephen King's It. You don't want to miss it, so subscribe immediately. Do it. That's that's right. And if you like any of our shows and you want to support us, then please consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia. Special thanks to new patrons Ryan C., Matt H., Justin B., Stephen B., Strifey, Shane L., and Darren Q. Uh, welcome, all of you. I think I might even recognize some of those names. Um, we really appreciate your support, and we hope you enjoy the cool stuff we have over on the Patreon. Absolutely. Uh, we have some new bonus content coming out just about every week. We're going to be doing Creep Show next week on other levels of the tower, so get ready for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. But of course, awesome. if you cannot afford to donate any money right now, that that is and always will remain absolutely okay. You can help us out by sharing this podcast with all your Stephen King loving friends. Uh, maybe you got some friends that just love short stories and have never really read any Stephen King short stories, but this would be the opportunity to do so. Share the podcast, tell them to pick up a copy of Night Shift or read those stories and then come hang out with us for a, a dozen hours <laughs> as we talk about them all. <laughs> Uh, also you can help us out by leaving a rating and review this week's spotlight review comes from roland prefect 1942 who gives us four stars and says a must for king fans i found this podcast in the early days of the lockdown in 2020 as a total tower junkie i was hooked right away the format of one in the know and one newbie succeeds at capturing the joy of sharing something you love with a new audience it's like showing your favorite movie to someone who's never seen it and then loving it just as much A fantastic way to make something I'm so familiar with feel fresh and new. Killing it now in season three. I'm hoping the audience continues to grow so we get a season four. Scott and Matt, keep up the great work. Thank Uh, you. So kind. Thank you so much, Roland. Um, I'm always speechless after these reviews because I don't know how to take compliments and I really appreciate it. I'm so glad that you're enjoying what we do. And uh, and yeah, we're definitely going to continue doing it forever. Yeah, it just makes me happy. It's it's like... It's like uh, I I enjoy doing this, and the fact that it brings joy to other people is just like, hey, wow! It's a way to just create joy in the world, and being part of that makes me very happy. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say joy to the world. Yeah, um, to um, you don't yeah. know the rest of the song, do you? I was really I, hoping you would sing the next line in the song. I. I, I'm not well, sure what's it's the about next. the Lord. It's the Lord hath coming, which doesn't really fit what we're doing here. But um. yeah, I wasn't entirely sure what the next line of the song was. So I was just, uh, <laughs> yeah. Also, it's uh, it's April. <laughs> so we can probably stop singing Christmas songs now. Uh, Speaking of which, you know what was funny about last week, Matt? And I know what? we didn't have a discussion question last week, but we have this long conversation about The Shining. And it was a good uh-huh. conversation. I was very happy with it. And like 90% of the comments we got on the episode were about the 30 seconds we spent talking about all dogs go to heaven at the very <laughs> end of the show. Uh, it just proves that our listeners listen right up until the very end. And I appreciate that so much because this is where the best content lives when we're tired, delirious, and keep talking for some reason. It's it's true. It's true. Yes, I'm the 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 internal sensor turns off and then suddenly the uh-huh. gold starts pouring out yep yep yeah all right folks we are finally going to end this episode though thank you so much for hanging out with us and we'll see you next week for more night shift long days and pleasant nights and may you have twice the number.